And I'm here to welcome you to our Spring uh, Dementia Summit 2023. My name is Pat Zook. I'm a family practice doctor. And I'm really here first to introduce our MC, uh, Dr. Kim Jaden, who's here. Dr. Tackle is also here. Uh, 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 both of them are um, former partners at the medical group, family doctors, and they're gonna help with the questions. So when you submit your questions, we'll try to entertain each of them. Those that we don't get to, we'll try to answer after the fact, as long as you uh, give us some information. Um, but um, Dr. Jaden is um, uh, a family doctor, and I'll introduce her in a minute. But before that, I want to introduce each of our staff people that we have. So if you look on the, your screen, you'll see from left to right, um, we have uh, two great care navigator educators, and some of you have met them. Tammy Kolbinger, please, that, that's Tammy Kolbinger. Uh, they're uh, care navigators educators, I should say. Christina Rodriguez, next to her. We have uh, Christina Wojski, she's a K, Christina. And we have two great volunteers, you know, Kay DeFries, and Kay, she's over by the admissions. And then uh, Tammy Line, who's helping with our production here today. So without our great staff, we wouldn't be where we are today. And we have a great culture where we work. So um, I'm going to introduce Dr. Kim Jaden, who will uh, take over here. She is a um, medical director of community health for Centric Care. She's a family doctor of 24 years. And uh, you'd never know that looking at her. Um, and uh, she, uh, along the way, got a master's in public health. So she is really into public health and primary care. All her patients just love her. They all think that they're the only patient she has. Uh, and so I'd like you to welcome the 2019 Minnesota Family Physician of the Year, <laughs> Kim James. Thank you, Pat. I'm here to do the logistics this morning. So first of all, welcome. Thank you all for being here this morning. Um, from a public health standpoint, uh, dementia is, um, sorry about that. Um, from a public health standpoint, uh, dementia is preventable. We don't talk about it enough. We don't think about it enough. I like to say that nobody wants to pay for, why am I? <laughs> Nobody wants to pay for studies on blueberries, right? They only want to study medications. And so um, things like exercise and nutrition and the, the really where we live, work, and play, we don't study enough. Um, and then from a primary care standpoint, from a family doctor standpoint, neurologist standpoint, it affects all of your body, right? Your entire body is affected by this disease. And so... Um, having, uh, educating yourself, educating your family members, and sometimes you have to educate your doctor. <laughs> um, so uh, I'll do the logistics here. Um, we are recording this event, and it will be available for about a week after the event. So um, don't say anything that you don't want people to hear for a week. If you have questions, if you are online with us this morning, you can put those in the Zoom's chat, Q box. chat box, not the Q&A, but the chat box. And that will be monitored over here to my right. And then if you are in person, I believe you all have index cards on your tables and you have pens, so you can jot a note and someone will come around and pick those up and Dr. Tackle and I will read those a little bit later on in the morning. This is the part I have to put my glasses on to read. So, do not consider anything that we say here today to be medical advice. Do not change your care plan without first discussing it with your clinician. While we appreciate the support of sponsors, grant makers, and donors, 
Opinions expressed here today are solely those of the speaker and not necessarily supported by our sponsors, grant makers, or donors. Anybody have questions about that? Okay, great. The agenda this morning. So we are doing our welcome and keynote now. We will have a conversation about the uh, resource center model of care. Then we will have just a short little break and then we will talk about nutrition advances for brain health as you're eating your fruity pebbles at home. <laughs> and then we're gonna have about a half an hour break. During that time, we really encourage you to visit our exhibitors, uh, which will be in the room across the hall. And, um, and then we'll have you back here at 1145 for our last conversation, which is gonna be about risk factors. And then at uh, one o'clock, we'll have a, a boxed lunch for you all, and then uh, conversation and round table, and if you have more questions, you can find one of us and ask questions. So with that, I don't know if you all know Dr. Zook, but he's been a family doctor here in St. Cloud for a few years. He retired in 2017 and at that time went on to found the Dementia Resource Center. He's been working to increase awareness of dementia even before he retired uh, by starting this conference about 10 years ago. And his message is a message of hope. Dementia can be treated. Its progress can be slowed. Individuals, families, and communities can live with improved symptoms and have a better quality of life. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Pat Zook, my excellent friend and genius. Thank you, Kim. So um, I want to bring you a, a message of hope. And I want that to be kind of our keynote message here today. So uh, we've been working with dementia, as Kim said, uh, several years. We've seen almost 200 people at our Dementia Resource Center clinic, and we've learned so much from our clients. And we've uh, been doing nonstop research into the problem of community response to dementia. And we think there's a good strategy that we can do, but what we know is we can't do it ourselves. We need the whole community. You've all heard the phrase, it takes a community to raise a child. Well, what about the other end of life spectrum? It takes a community to help us who are over age 65 and dealing with complex medical issues like dementia. So our idea several years ago was to have meetings uh, in the, uh, uh, in the, in the area, and we drew people from well outside of St. Cloud, about 80 people, professionals, doctors, nurses, social workers, teachers, interested parties. And we were looking at what is insufficient about our dementia management system globally as a community. And we found many gaps in care. And these gaps aren't just what happens in the doctor's office, what prescriptions and so forth. No, it's, it's way bigger than that. What we found was the folks down, uh, down the hall there, the exhibitors who have dementia resources, uh, who have businesses that speak to the needs of families dealing with dementia, they weren't being found. They weren't getting the referrals that they needed to do good dementia care. So one thing led to another, but we came up with the concept of a center of excellence. Um, my friend, Dr. Nick Grader, I remember Nick back in the St. Cloud Medical Group. He and I both came to St. Cloud on July 1st, 1977. And Nick started off as an internist, family doctor, both boarded, and eventually turned to oncology. And I remember helping your nurse start IVs back in the medical group just down the road here uh, years ago. But uh, a center of excellence like the Coburn's Cancer Center has a special place in complex medical issues like oncology and all the related hematology and other services. So we wanted to do something similar, a center of excellence for dementia management and care. And that's kind of what we're doing. What we've found is 
new things don't come into medicine quickly. There was a doctor or two in, I believe it was Australia, who came up with the idea that a germ, Helicobacter pylori, was the cause of 80% of ulcers. Well, that doctor and his colleagues were practically drummed out of medicine because no one could believe that a bacteria could cause ulcers. But after 15 years of being shunned and uh, dispensed with by the medical uh, establishment, everyone else started to get the same results and they realized he was right all along, 15 years. So if it takes 15 years to get a new concept into daily care on the front line where these two have worked, um, those of us who are anxious to get the results don't have 15 years if we're already 65 and older. So um, in medicine, when they do research, they like to talk about evidence-based medicine, that what you do is based on evidence. And I get it that NASA has a checklist where you rigidly follow before launch. You have a rigid, that, so you never mess up. You have that. And I get that. But when there are new innovative things like the H. pylori causing ulcers, I think we need to open up and accept new things, especially if there's no hazards or consequences that are negative as a result. So what we do is quite different from the usual um, medical visits. We center our um, assessments and our evaluation of patients on dementia risk factors. And that's not fancy like a spec scan or an FDG glucose uptake scan of your brain or an MRI. Um, and we talk nutrition. And in medical school, we didn't learn anything about nutrition. We'll have a whole talk on that in a little bit. But if we can just get society and the powers that be, meaning the people who pay the bills, the insurance companies and Medicare, to value the things that we know now know work for dementia, why don't we pay for that instead of a $56,000 a year medication that requires four intravenous infusions, four MRIs, because it has a 40% chance of shrinking your brain and causing inflammation. Why don't we pay for the things that we now know work? Now, work doesn't mean cure. Healing does not mean curing. Healing is different than cure. We in our American thinking, we want cure. Walk for the cure. Run for the cure. Donate for the cure. I think we need to get our American medical system turned around to pay for what works, whether someone can make a billion dollars on it or not. No one's going to make a billion dollars or a hundred billion dollars on dementia. And I think, I hate to say it, but I think that's why progress has been so slow. As we go through each talk, I'm going to ask my colleagues here to stop me or um, tell me it's time to move on or um, so I'm just not a talking head. And I lost my watch in Florida, so I'm going to uh, <laughs> use my, uh, my wedding watch, too. So, um, so I'm going to use my phone if that's OK. I'm not checking my email or anything, just so you know. It's my clock. So um, we're going to leave about 10 minutes. And uh, who's got the, t uh, yeah, they're going to give me the, the, the umbrella jerk uh, if uh, it's getting late in the talk. And we'll ask for questions with about 10 minutes to go for each session. But please write your questions down. If you just hold them up, one of our uh, folks will come and pick them up at the table. Uh, and those of you online, we appreciate your presence. And please send your questions in online on the chat box, and we'll do our best. Tammy Lene is going to uh, write those down and bring them over to our panelists here. And so that's kind of the format we'd like to do. So um, dementia care as it's practiced in the United States isn't what we think it should be. We don't want to replace that. We want to add ourselves on top of what's already being done. Because when a neurologist evaluates you and proves that you don't have any of the other many dozen conditions that we might miss, that's very valuable. We, we need our standard 
uh, dementia system to help us be sure that we're not missing something like that. So we would like to just add to what's already being done, but what we do takes about five or six hours on average for each client. And your doctor just doesn't have five or six hours. They get 20 minutes. The insurance company gives them 20 minutes. Now some like Dr. Tackle and Jaden would take way more than 20 minutes, but it sort of came out of their hide one way or another if they did that. The system isn't set up for five or six hours. So our idea is to collaborate and collaborate with the primary care uh, physician, uh, nurse practitioner, uh, physician assistant, whoever, we use the word clinician. So if you see us using the word clinician, we recognize that more and more in the future, it won't be a physician. We use the word clinician, just so you know. But our standard uh, care is like this. You get a, a mom has got dementia, the doctor says, and the family gathers together, they call each other, they gather together in the parking lot, sobbing and hugging each other, and no one gives them any direction, like, where do I do next? Where do I go from here? That's just the way it is. We give you the news and off you go. Or worse yet, um, you have dementia, there's nothing we can do, come back in a year. Or even worse, um, you're not bad enough for medication. Why don't you come back in a year, and if you're worse enough, we'll give you medication. So that's what we currently do. But the family feels helpless and doesn't have any direction. But what if you could do it different? What if you could do it in a more collaborative way? Not, in fact, in fact leaving the primary care clinician in charge, but we just have a system that can be added to what the primary care clinician does. We support them. You know, the Alzheimer's uh, disease group, they do an annual report, and their annual report is a very comprehensive assessment of dementia care in the United States. And what they've said the last two or three reports is family doctors are not comfortable doing dementia care. So we wanna work against that. We wanna make them comfortable. When I talk to my neurology colleagues who do dementia care, they say there's no way we can do all the dementia. We just can't. There aren't enough of us. When we started, it took five months, maybe six months, to get in to see a neurologist. Well, I'm sad to report it still takes five or six months. We've tried and tried and tried. We've lost a couple. Um, neurology is struggling, I think, for a variety of reasons why they're having trouble recruiting. Um, but we still need the specialist involved in the system. We still need the primary care person to take charge. We want to just collaborate with them, superimpose what we're doing on a primary care clinician who feels empowered. And we hope they'll fe feel empowered if we get out of the office and teach them more. So far in our Dementia Resource Center clinic, we've been so busy <laughs> that we haven't done enough of that. And we'd like to do more of that. And in fact, we're looking to maybe hire additional clinical personnel so that I can get out and do more advocacy work and pound on the desk of the legislators to make sure that we get a system that pays for the kind of care we really need. Not the $56,000 a year intravenous drug that makes somebody $100 billion. So I got that off my chest, didn't I? That feels good. <laughs> Yo, and by the way, last year we had this meeting about a month earlier. We were right across the street at the Paramount. I don't know if any of you were there, if you remember. We had a tornado watch and we had hail. We had a thunderstorm. I was on the stage and I could hear the hailstones hitting the metal roof over the stage. And I thought for sure our power was going to go out, but hallelujah, it didn't. But I guess it shows uh, this must be the lucky side of the street because <laughs> we got ourselves a beautiful day here today. So we do, uh, we call it personalized dementia care, or it actually, you've, maybe you've heard the word functional medicine. Functional medicine is a different way of practicing. Instead of just dealing with the smoke, you deal with the fire. Well, most of what we do in medicine, uh, treating blood pressure that's elevated, I can give you a drug that lowers your blood pressure. But if I dealt with the problem that caused the blood pressure, what if I went upstream to what the cause of that blood pressure was and fix that. Then I wouldn't just have to give you the $250 a month pill 
to control your blood pressure. Same with diabetes. All these Ozempics and drugs are now being used for weight loss, hundreds of dollars a month. But if you went upstream and figured, let's fix this person's diet, you could make 90% or more of type 2 diabetes go away if you could do that. But no one pays for that. We pay for Ozempic. $500, what's the new one? Monjero, $700 a month, whatever it's going to be. Um, we need our system to change. But what we do is individualize the care. We go upstream and look at the causes of why you may have dementia symptoms. Now, we do see people uh, who don't have dementia. We see people for preventive. They say, I know I have risk factors. I want to uh, assess those. I want to plan for how I can minimize my risk factors so I don't get dementia. We do those, too. But it doesn't matter uh, what, um, well, it does matter what phase of dementia you're in. The earlier you are, the better. The earlier you are in your progress, the more good we can do for you. That's true. But we don't give up on anybody. If you can make it into our office and get through our three-hour interview, we'll take you and we'll help you. And we think when you work on risk factors, you're going upstream to the cause as much as anything. And doesn't that make more sense anyway than just treating the symptoms? When you get your first symptom of dementia, let's say at age 65, you've had the process going on for 30 years before that. Your brain has a marvelous ability through a process much like pruning an apple tree or thinning the radishes. It helps the brain continue to function without symptoms 10 years, 20 years, even 30 years before your first symptom pops out. Now, they didn't teach us that in medical school. We didn't know that 30 years before dementia, that's where the action is. If we get people when they're 30 or 40 and, can, and try to convince a 30-year-old that they need to do preventive medicine, that's another story. But, um, but that's where it's at. If we can get upstream 20 or 30 years and prevent it, that would work better than any of the drugs we have today. And I maintain what we do. What we do, we didn't invent this model of care. Dr. Bredesen, Dale Bredesen in California did. We try to emulate what he and others do. Dr. Richard Isaacson at Wild Cornell in New York and others, we're, we're emulating what they do. We didn't invent this. But I think it's the right way to go. And as a matter of fact, almost anything that I say here today, someone could argue against what I say. But that's true of every medical meeting. It doesn't matter what you say. There could be somebody in the back of the room they will say, well, I did a study and it didn't show that, it showed this. Okay, that's true. But what you're getting from me here today is my sifting through hours and hours, books, articles, podcasts, et cetera, and you're getting it from me, and these are my opinions, as we said in the disclaimer. But it's the best I can offer you, and it's advice that I would follow myself. So my, my kids always give me a grief if I pull out the Giardilli chocolate bar, and it's, now what, Papa, is that what you're supposed to have? And um, when the checkout lady at Barley's gives me a, a funny look when I pull something out, I, I see it's for the grandkids. It's not for me. But um, important that um, whatever system you have, that you support the caregivers. You know, I see evaluations from all over the place. We read the evaluations people have already had from medical centers, even our very largest medical center in the whole state. There's very little said about caregivers. What we at our, do at our Dementia Resource Center, 90% of what we do is helping caregivers. Sure, we help the person living with dementia, and that's the word we use, the person living with dementia. And you'll see that abbreviation in the notes here. But um, if, you, if you isolate the person as a case, you're taking them out of the family context of what's really important, the whole family. It's a, whole family issue. And you can't just isolate a case and do a good job. You can do it, but then you get, there's nothing we can do come back in a year. Well, that doesn't fly either. There's lots we can do. And a lot of it has to do with diet, lifestyle, and so forth. And our personalized system, we look at medications. Many people come to us on medications that have cognitive side effects, four of them not unusual. If you're taking a drug 
that has cognitive side effects and you have cognitive dysfunction at some level, what's wrong with this picture? Maybe that needs to change. So um, we think that on average, if you have 10 medications or 12, we'll probably be able, with collaborating with your primary care clinician, get you off two or three of those. What if the 100,000 people living with dementia in Minnesota all got off two or three pills? Over a year, do you know how many millions of dollars that would save? And could that money be funneled back into a system of dementia care clinics like ours, 25 of them throughout the state of Minnesota, so no one has to drive more than 30 miles? I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll talk about that later. Uh, but that's kind of my vision, where we want to go with this. Other states have that. Other, Wisconsin has over 40 memory clinics scattered around the state. They started with a $3.5 million grant in Madison, Wisconsin several years ago, and they have a huge staff of people. And they don't use the model of care that I would prefer, but they still have memory clinics scattered throughout the state. Florida has similar, Florida has gigantic clinics. Each one is like a Mayo Clinic. It's only 13 clinics. I prefer the smaller clinics in more places model. We do, as I uh, mentioned, these uh, evaluations. We do an intake. We'll talk about that in particular. We do an intake. Tammy or Christina does that. And um, that's where we get the people who are insincere or just looking for a quick fix. She'll tell them, our system isn't for you. This isn't drive through, stick your arm out the window, get a shot, and on your way. We're way more, we, we demand way more of our clients than that. It takes a commitment. <laughs> Uh, we do the preventive evaluations, so we've done quite a few of those. And people are amazed at what they can do from a prevention standpoint, even starting with medications, even in their 40s or 50s, before they have any symptoms. We do caregiver coaching. Tammy and Christina are veterans. They've been doing this for 15 or more years, between them dealing with dementia behaviors. And caregiver coaching is a lifesaver for many people. We do education. We've given over 36 talks, and uh, some big ones, some little ones. But every time we do, we get a little bit more input and feedback of what people are really worried about. And uh, that's helped us. Uh, we're also starting a dementia-informed counseling. Kay DeFries, who's one of our volunteers, is helping us get that set up. Uh, we've had to rework our original concept, but that will be starting soon. What we've noticed is when people have been married for 55 and 60 years, you know, it's sort of like how you might feel about a, a baseball great like Yogi Berra walks into the room. But we've seen people perform at that level in their relationships, and it's such a privilege for us to see in our evaluations. And, um, but, you know, after 55 years, you've sort of gotten a rhythm to your relationship. And when dementia gets in there, it throws you off the track. And it's really tough. And I can see, we can see two or three visits with a professional to help you get reoriented. A lot of it has to do with denial in the caregiver. Oh, he's not writing the checks anymore because he always wrote the checks and he's just being mean. Well, he has cognitive dysfunction. He can't, they can't see it. They're, these are intelligent people, but the denial that my big, strong check writer can't do it anymore, the denial is there. A few visits to a counselor we think would help get people back on track with their relationship of 55 years. So we're, we've seen the need for that and we're swimming upstream, but we're gonna make that happen. So um, this is a lot about uh, what we do there, but primarily it's about empowering primary care clinicians to do dementia care with us helping. Um, we decide that we're going to do and find what works for dementia care. And I think we've found that. We have many things that we can fix and make better. Now we're going to have to go out and figure out how we're going to get insurance and Medicare to pay for it. Dr. Tackle and I are volunteers. You're not going to get 30-year-old volunteers to do what we're doing. So we need to find a way to pay for it. We do pay our other staff, but we live on grants and donations. So feel free to use the donation packets that are conveniently placed on your table here today. Um, 
But uh, as I said, the, um, the neurologists just don't have the capacity to see every dementia patient. So we think we can empower primary care to do 90% of routine dementia care. Um, so the education we talked about, what you guys are seeing up here is way bigger. I'm with my uh, newly good eyes. I'm trying to read the tiny letters way back there. Oh, and the dementia services providers. That's the word we use to describe. I don't know, I've got my glasses. Oh, no. I thought these are yours. Oh, there. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, yeah, it doesn't help for 30 feet away. So oh. it, it only helps for here. Uh, but um, we want to accept them into the treatment management community system of dementia care as colleagues. They weren't being found. When Kathy Gilbride called me into their office, which paradoxically was the old medical group building downtown, uh, six or seven years ago, she said, the doctors aren't finding the dementia services people. And she knew we had done public health campaigns before for whooping cough and controlled substances. She said, why don't you do one on dementia? And uh, we studied the problem, and sure enough, I, we had no idea who these people were. Well, there's 10 or so of them down the hall. Please visit them today and ask what they do. Even if it doesn't pertain to you, you might know somebody who could utilize those services. So I'd ask you to go and talk with them. Ask them what their favorite cigarette is, and that'll get the conversation going. <laughs> so um, like this kid on the front of the St. Paul Science Museum, we want to dream big. We want to dream big and maybe consider getting 25 or 30 clinics like ours around the state. We think it's best if hardly anyone has to drive more than 30 miles. We want the clinic to be a regular place of comfort. You can go there and not worry about showing your deficits and feel accepted there. And you can talk. You know, we, we started doing our evaluations. It took three hours, the, the, the final evaluation. There's a preliminary one and then the chart review. And the final one we call the initial evaluation. And they took about three hours. And we thought, how are we going to get 82-year-old couple to sit through three hours? Well, they loved it. They didn't want to leave. We couldn't believe it. And you know, it'd take bathroom breaks or sip water or whatever. But um, people like the fact that this is like a home base for dementia care. It actually caused a bit of a problem because we do have support groups. But people, I think, felt a little bit less of a need of support groups. If they have a phone availability, they can call Tammy or Christina or me and get support almost any time. And that's so unusual in medicine in general. And I don't know how long we'll be able to keep doing that, but it seems to work. It seems to be what people need. They feel very supported when they have a center, a place, a center of excellence to deal with this problem that they're so embarrassed about. Chris Tackle told me a story once about, um, you know, when we do Medicare annual wellness exams, we do a little mini cog, a little memory test. And I think sometimes you do a MOCA as well. I, I, I don't remember, but um, anyway, Chris told me once that uh, a guy came in for his third or fourth annual Medicare annual wellness. And as soon as Chris walked in the room, the guy says, face velvet church, Daisy Red. <laughs> right off the bat because they were so anxious about that going in. And you shouldn't have to feel anxious about it. We're on your side. And if we are careful with our words, we make you feel comfortable doing that. Maybe we'll chuckle a little bit like we just did. Life is far too serious to be taken too seriously. So we chuckle and you, and it's not unusual in our evaluation to hear laughter and mirth coming forth from the room. And our staff can attest to that. So um, this, this network of dementia resource clinics would have to have a state sponsorship in some way. So if I can get new providers coming in to do what I'm doing, I'll have more time to go down and talk to the powers that be in the state or the medical school. I would prefer it to actually be run by the medical school, similar to what they do in Wisconsin. And um, 
it would require training. You need specific training to do what we're doing. We're, we're self-taught, I hate to say it, but we're, we are self-taught over six or seven years, and we're still learning and we'll never learn at all. So just so you know. Uh, but the state would uh, also put some pressure on insurance companies who stand to save hundreds of millions of dollars to put some of that money back into programs like what we're talking about here. So if you have any leverage with your legislators, please talk to them about that very same thing. Now I put way more words on each slide than you're supposed to do for these, but in case you forget or you, you wanna just, if you can, and we'll have copies of the slides on the website, you can review it later. You could get a lot just by reading the slides. This is where we work and this, is the Minnesota Center, the beautiful building. The Centric Air donates the space to us. They even pay our utilities. So Centric Air believes in what we're doing. They've been very helpful. They even give us a bunch of equipment and so forth. But we have an office here, it's all on one floor. Some of you have been there and we're very grateful for that. So we have to follow the rules and the rules of um, something called the Stark Law says that an entity cannot order tests that benefits itself. So we're not allowed because of the Stark Law uh, to order the tests that we recommend at the end of our evaluations. We send the report back to the primary care clinician and ask them to order the test. Now that's a little uncomfortable because sometimes they do them and sometimes they don't. And we're trying to prove the benefits of what we do, but if the Referring clinician only does half the tests that we recommend. How are we gonna measure our success? So we're, we're, we're struggling with that. So we're just waiting for a donor to give us about $60,000 a year so we pay our rent and then we can order all the tests we want. But anyway, we have this lovely building. This is the office and those um, ugly brown chairs, no one ever sits in those because that's the waiting room. No one ever sits there. How many people go to the doctor's office and the doctor and the staff greet you at the door? That's what we do. The only people that use those chairs are the eye doctor right next door. When their waiting room is full, they come and sit in our office. But other than that, nobody sits in those chairs. Now, during these talks, I've asked my colleagues here to stop me if there's anything unusual that I said or needs further clarification. So far, we're okay, right? Okay. Great because I don't want to just be a talking head here. But how do we survive? Well, we get a lot of in-kind support from our board members. So Brad Hansen from um, Quinlan Van Hughes Law Firm has done lots of work for us. He's been very helpful. And Marie Primus from Bergen KDV, the accounting firm, she just does nonprofit accounting. She's been very helpful with our tax returns and all that financial stuff. Um, Bob Mahol from just down the street here, Mahold Insurance has been very helpful. And several of our board members, like Rick Tandler here, helping us with planning and strategic planning. And he helped us uh, clear out our office recently when we had to clean up our files. So we get good support from our board of directors and uh, we have some fabulous volunteers. Uh, but we're pretty much dependent on grants. We get some lovely grants and at the end of the um, conference today, we'll put up all the grantor people. Uh, Minnesota Board on Aging, um, uh, actually the Minnesota Medical Association gave us a small grant and others, but grants and donations. So we currently do billing and coding and all that and it's a disaster because insurance companies don't wanna pay for dementia. And why? Because Medicare doesn't pay for dementia. If Medicare doesn't pay for it, they don't wanna pay for it. Now, surprise the heck out of me when Health Partners sent us a check for $50,000 before the end of the year. They believe in what we're doing, but when we submit bills, we submit a bill for 100, we get 17 or whatever, equivalent. So actually we're working for almost less than what we used to pay our babysitter per hour. So that's not gonna work, not forever. We need to fix that. So we exist on donations and grants until we can convince our federal legislators who do Medicare and our state legislators who could pressure the insurance companies to kick in some funds to support what we're doing until we can make that happen. But tell you, that's a long-term goal. 
uh, it doesn't happen very quickly. Each of our evaluations in total is about five or six hours. Uh, the intake is 90 minutes to two hours. That's what Tammy or Christina does. Uh, my chart review is usually online. I go online, we have ways to do that and look through the chart for on the average 90 minutes, sometimes two hours if it's complicated. And we build a report. It starts with the intake, Tammy gives it to me. I build it further with the chart review. And then we have the initial evaluation, the big evaluation. Christina or Tammy will be there with me. Uh, Christina Weischke, our community health person, will be there. And sometimes we'll have medical students or residents. And this is a golden opportunity for us to influence and twist the arm of the young doctors to, be, to maybe go into this. Right now, they all have a couple hundred thousand dollars in debt. And you're thinking, I'm going to be a dermatologist, you know, <laughs> or a radiologist. So I can pay off that debt before I retire. Uh, so we have some work to do. In, on uh, doing that, but um, our evaluations take about six hours total. Some have taken longer, um, but what they're paying us doesn't really cover that. But what we found is that this is what it takes. You can't do dementia care in a 20 minute office. I don't care who you are. So this is Tammy and me. Do you remember that day, Tammy, when we put the decal up on the door? That was really exciting. It was during the COVID, as you can see, we had our masks on. But uh, to date, we've seen almost 200 clients. There's a lot of other outputs here. We started two years ago. Um, two years ago, we actually started over at Whitney for the first several months. And it wasn't until September of uh, that year, five months we were at Whitney. And we're grateful to the city of St. Cloud who owns and operates Whitney for letting us have our start in the um, little room at Whitney. and. Uh, We've taken care of or talked with or supported 474 caregivers. A better word for caregiver is care partner, but when I say care partner, nobody knows what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna keep using caregiver. Because you are a care partner for many years, maybe it, towards the end of life, you're a caregiver, but um, that's a lot of people that we've helped. And we think we've helped the caregivers as much or more as the people living with dementia. We've been to health fairs, we've tried the different things, we've had speaking engagements. It's fun because we do a speaking engagement. The following weeks we get all kinds of consultations, so it's kind of fun. And we've been careful not to get overwhelmed so that we're making people wait more than a month or two. We've rarely gone over a month. Getting ready for this concert, we've sort of, or this, um, summit we've kind of gotten behind, but um, we're trying not to make people wait. Hey, so, um, <coughs> Dr. Zook. Yes, ma'am. Um, could someone just show up at your door? Or do they have to be referred by their primary care doctor? Or how does that work? Well, we have people show up at our door every day because they think we're the eye doctor's office and they walk in. <laughs> <laughs> so. That's sort of a little joke among us, but so people walk in all the time. But in reality, um, I've seen people walk in and um, our staff, I don't know how they do it, but they find a way to you know, get, take their name and number and get them an appointment. And it's kind of like primary care when I started in 1977. Everyone knew my nurse and they would just call Jan and Jan knew what to do. And it, it, so it's a little bit like that. So, and I don't know when we get really big if that's going to change, but I hope not. But, but they can self-refer. You can self-refer. So what we do is we back consult. So Mary Smith walks into our office. We get her set up. We ask who her primary care clinician is, and then we have them take the report to their primary care clinician, which is usually usually the first that the clinician finds out about it, and then. Um, Hopefully the clinician will call me. They, they really don't call me very often, which I'm a little disappointed because I want to have the opportunity to talk to them more. But um, we've had referrals from the residency. We get a lot of referrals from social workers who see a situation that's dire and difficult. Uh, we get referrals from friends of our former clients fairly commonly. So then we back consult with their primary care. Sometimes we're well received because they already know about us, and sometimes we're not so well received. Like, who's this Zook character? What's he doing making all these recommendations? I've been a doctor for five years. Why would he 
tell me what to do. You know, I mean, we're trying not to do that. We're trying to not be that way. But uh, we feel a sense of urgency that our legislators don't feel. Did I satisfy that question? Yep. <laughs> uh, and again, I'll remind you, if you have questions, write them down, hold them up, and people will come and pick them up. And those of you online, please uh, submit them in the chat box. So we've learned a lot. We've learned that these relationships that people have had for 50 and 60 years are incredible. There's a lot of healing power in us maintaining that relationship. And so we don't take the people out of context of where they live and who they live with. You, you can't do that with dementia. You have to take all that into consideration. 90% of what we do is supporting the caregiver and the family. And the person living with dementia usually is in a good mood when we see them for some reason, and they're content. But um, we've learned that those relationships are special, and if we get a dementia-informed counseling program going, we'll keep those relationships. And there is a lot of healing power in those relationships, and we recognize that. And that's why we're getting that counseling program going. Um, we did a survey recently, and I don't know if any of you are business people, but you know, if you send out a survey quite often, you'll get three or 4% response rate. We sent it out to 120 of our clients and asked them, how are we doing? 44 responded, which is incredible return rate. And of the 44, all but one gave us five out of five for every category. So we think, now maybe the others that didn't respond, and people called us and said, oh, I'm sorry, I can't respond because of this or that. I mean, they felt bad that they couldn't respond. But it tells us we're on the right track, at least from their, their satisfaction. Now, we're going to satisfy Blue Cross Blue Shield, United Healthcare, Medica, and Medicare, I don't know. But the customers, the people, the clients that we take care of like what we're doing so far. Um, and then our grant makers. Our grant makers have been, you know, from the state especially, uh, have been very helpful to us. They want us to succeed. So even if it, in the cases where we didn't fill the grant application out, they called us even after the deadline and said, if you just do this, then we can approve you. I mean, that's unheard of. People are so impressed with our mission. Our mission is to improve access to quality dementia care in our community. And what's our community? Well, our community, as far as our influence reaches, which is to the edges of Minnesota right now. We've had people come from Alexandria, the cities, Pine City, I mean, all over the state. We don't turn anyone away as long as they can get to our door. We can't see people in another state, but they can come here if they want to. Um, we are getting an electronic medical record. We're hoping to scale up to the much larger federal grant. And a federal grant requires you to have electronic medical record. We're pretty much doing it by uh, Microsoft products, and uh, we have all kinds of security, privacy, and all that. But when we get electronic medical record, we think QMD will be really good at that. And you might say, well, why don't you just do the EPIC system that the hospital uses? Well, um, it's too hard. <laughs> Let me just say it's too hard. We need to get it done right away, and therefore, uh, CureMD was able to do it right away. Uh, right away is a relative term. In computer world, that means within six months. Um, so we've been collaborating with several agencies of the state. They've been very helpful. They've been very uh, generous in their promotion of what we're doing. We talk to people all the time. We have people come into our Dementia Resource Center and say, I'm so-and-so, my business is this, uh, it's part of the state network of that, and we want to work with you. We do that all the time. And that collaboration is what we're talking about, the community response to dementia. This big, hairy problem of dementia management is too big for just our clinic or just me or any of our staff. We need all kinds of collaboration. And the government agencies have the power and um, at the medical school, uh, we think we'll find a good collaboration. We have an opportunity. The St. Cloud Hospital is going to have a medical school develop in town here, which we want to get the baby doctors on board with what we're doing and the other practitioners, you know, the nurse practitioners, the 
uh, physician assistants, the social workers, and all the other people that will be part of that organization. And um, I was going to be on a phone call with uh, Dr. Cindy Smith just the other day, and we missed connections, but um, talking about the medical school and the opportunities for dementia care to be taught at an early phase. Now, when you're a dean of a medical school, people call you all the time and try to tell you what you need to teach those doctors. And we get that. But this is going to be a big part of our medical what we need to do in our community. And so we think uh, we have a great opportunity with that. So I'll entertain any questions if we have any. I never thought I would see Pat Zook done <laughs> half an hour early. <laughs> Actually, like I said, I'm a better counter puncher than puncher, so uh, <laughs> go ahead and fire away. We already had some questions online. Yeah. Oh. Um, do you want to go through some questions that might be related to your next conversations, or do you want to try to keep any, it general? Any of those would be fine. Here's someone asking a question or two. Here, bring them. That's okay. <laughs> we have to weed through those. <laughs> So I, I read all the time, you know, and I get podcasts and I, everything else. And uh, Kim and I were on the phone last night because she was in Florida 24 hours ago. And we were talking about the podcast and she said, oh, I'm listening to that one too. So um, it's, we learn the front, the leading edge of what's new in medicine quite often is discussed in those podcasts. So we didn't do podcasts when I was in medical school. Podcasts weren't invented then, you know. So, but um, anyway, there's a question about does um, vitamin deficiency have a lot to do with dementia or brain health? Well, of course it does, you know, but um, vitamins uh, deals with nutrition. And the amount of nutrition education that we got in medical school was a thimbleful and barely that. So um, it turns out when we get older, we don't absorb vitamins as well as we did when we're, when we're young. And the vitamins most critical for brain and nerve function are the B vitamins. B1, which is thiamine, B6, which is pyridoxine, B9, which is folic acid, B12, which is cyanocobalamin, and others in the B category. If you don't have stomach acid, you can't absorb those. Well, why wouldn't I have stomach acid? Well, do you take omeprazole every day of your life? Like, several million people do in this country, or drugs like it? Yeah. Well, if you don't have stomach acid, it's very hard for your body to absorb your B12 pill or your B complex pill, or the B vitamins stacked in your good food that you're eating. So even if you eat food that contains the B vitamins, and you're not gonna absorb that and have your body have access to it if you don't have any stomach acid. And a lot of people are running around with very little stomach acid. So if you take omeprazole twice a day or Pepsid twice a day or whatever twice a day, you're not going to absorb vitamins. And even without that, people lose the ability to create stomach acid, even without pills. By the time we're 65 and older, your stomach acid goes way down. And so vitamins are very important. And, you know, my colleagues, when I see their evaluations where they've already seen the patient for dementia, they do a B12, and every once in a while, they'll do a folate. But other than that, they have no idea what, how important the B vitamins are. When I was in residency and training, we had people come into the county hospital who were in alcohol withdrawal. And you remember the first thing we did, we gave them a shot of thiamine, B1. Because if we didn't, if we fed them carbohydrates with inadequate B1, they got very sick. It was an emergency. So. Um, but other than that, we had very little training about that. Um, but I'm kind of into the food stuff and the nutrition stuff, as you'll see as we go on here today. But yes, vitamins are very important. And um, I can't make a blanket recommendation for very many things because what I would think is right for you as an individual may not be right for the very next person. But there aren't too many places where I think you'll get in trouble taking a B-complex vitamin other than your wife will get mad because you're, when you drip urine on the toilet, it's bright yellow spots, you know, so that's, that doesn't go over well. 
But that's the worst of it. And your urine smells funny. But people ask about vitamins all the time. Um, but supplements is a big thing, and I read about supplements all the time. And the experts who do supplements, they'll take 70 or 80 of them a day. Well, there isn't room in your stomach for that much vitamins. I don't know how they do that. Thank you, ma'am. What foods are high in B vitamins? Well, um, the carnivore diet has a lot of B vitamins, unfortunately. Uh, but you can get it from uh, green leafies as well. So the green leafy spinach and kale and all that stuff. I've tried eating kale several times. My mistake was I got the one with the stems in it. When you're chewing those stems, it gets stuck in your teeth. It isn't much fun. But um, B vitamins, uh, you, you can get a lot from uh, animal products. But um, it's a big argument back and forth about whether we should eat animal products. So I, I'm a believer in grass-fed beef. Um, I think if the cow eats corn all day and all its life and gets sick from eating corn, because cows aren't supposed to eat corn, they'll be fat and have a lot of fat and their, their meat will taste good. But they're really sick. And there isn't much vitamins and nutrients in the meat other than the pure protein. When the cows eat grass, they get vitamin K from the grass. And most of you probably never heard of vitamin K. Vitamin K is critical for brain function. And it's in the grass. So when the cow eats the grass and we eat the cow, we get the vitamin K. Unless you take it as a supplement, that's a, a common way to get your vitamin K. Now, vitamin K is also in the green leafies. And uh, people who are on cumin and a blood thinner that works by binding your vitamin K, uh, they can't eat too much green. So, I was just um, setting a timer so you don't go over. <laughs> thank you <laughs> for sharing that. How are we doing on the... I have to check my watch. We have a couple questions over here. Okay, fire away. Uh, somebody wanted to know about the hereditary predisposition and the whole genetics piece. Yeah, so the question is about genetics and dementia. So there are cases where people, even at a young age in their 20s and 30s, get dementia. And that's a strong hereditary predisposition. That's less than 2% of dementia. And there were cases in South America and Central America where this was very common based on a genetic variant. But that's quite rare, and we've not seen that. But what you do inherit is the tendency to smoke. What you do inherit is the tendency to get diabetes. What you do inherit is the tendency to get high blood pressure. You do inherit sleep apnea in, to some extent. You inherit coronary artery disease. And when you inherit those, you inherit the risk for dementia that is increased when you have those conditions. So in a sense, you could say it's inheritable, but it's more cultural than anything else in terms of the smoking. Although I think the genetics, and they're talking about genetic skipping uh, generations, and we'll talk a little bit more about personal trauma and how that can affect not only the children of the person suffering trauma, but the grandchildren. And that's kind of mysterious to me, but there's a lot of arguments about genetics. And just about everything we do in medicine now is genetics-based. There's very few articles written that don't mention genetic alleles, like six digits with numbers and letters that don't mean anything to us, but it indicates a gene that makes a protein. But it's very, very uh, uh, complex. The good news about genetics is we can overcome bad genetics. Now, we didn't learn that in medical school. You have gene A. Gene A causes you to have your hair curly. You're going to have curly hair if you have gene A. Well, it's not that simple. Because gene B, C, and D control the expression of gene A. And if you eat these kind of foods and you climb mountains or some other oddball variable, you suppress gene A and you don't get curly hair. So it's way complicated. But um, you can overcome bad genes. Now, you may have heard of the APOE4 allele. That's a common genetic test that people have done, which does increase your risk for dementia. If you, you, for, for alleles, you get two copies, one from your parent, either parent. And if you get a double copy of APOE4, your risk for dementia is like 80% or more. But even those folks, if they get into a program like Dr. Bredesen's, like what we're talking about here, and do the things 100%, 
you can suppress the expression of that gene so that dementia symptoms don't pop out, even though you have the genes for it. We never learned that in medical school. We thought if you had gene A, you get the effect of gene A. And the, the effect of the gene is called the phenotype. So you're not doomed if you have APOE4. Even if you have two copies, don't give up hope. But we're at the APOE4, we can't get the geneticist to even order those tests. Nobody wants to do the test because then you have to give someone the result. And the geneticists are afraid that if I give you a horrible result, you're gonna go out and kill yourself, then I'll get sued. Nobody wants to do that. So when we ask them, can we, you think we can do it? Oh no, let's not do genetic tests. Where it's going to matter is when we do have drugs that are effective for dementia. They won't be used when you already have dementia. They'll be used when you're 30 or 40 years old and the biomarker tests indicate a high risk. That's when we'll use the drug. Not when the barn is burned down, that's too late. So, um, and genetics will drive what medications are needed. So right now, we, like for depression, we just pick one and say, oh, let's try this one, you know, and 20 years from now, that'll look so archaic because you will never prescribe an antidepressant without knowing the genotype, and the artificial intelligence will tell you you never want to give uh, this particular antidepressant to this person because they have this, that, and that gene profile, but uh, it's very complex. Rick Tandler on their board is talking about AI development. He has some connections. And there's no way to do dementia well, really well, without using artificial intelligence, AI. And that's where it's gonna be. It's gonna be that way for a lot of medical, complex medical care. Nobody wants to do that. We have a couple of uh, related questions. One is, uh, and this is, a, I, know, I know it'll be more of a complex answer. What doctors in the St. Cloud area uh, deal with dementia and kind of also related, will insurance cover if my doctor writes a referral? Now that's a good question. The, the question is about insurance coverage and who does dementia. Well, not to brag, but we do dementia care. <laughs> so we do that. Um, but um, we found family doctors and nurse practitioners and physician assistants who do a credible job. So, but you have to ask them. You remember, the way we do medicine is when they take on a complex case, they're taking on a financial loss. It's a financial liability to do complex care. You get paid for production, and you can't produce in dementia care. You just can't. If you can do one in the morning, one in the afternoon, well, you'd go out of business. And when you bill, $10 and Medicare pays you 58 cents. I mean, how long can you keep the doors open? So, other, but so they asked about who does it and um, you could just call around and I hate to give you the names of people that we've seen, but um, what people used to do when they wanted to know something about our practices, they would call our nurses. <laughs> who do everything about, everybody does, you know, which of us does this or that. And it's true in family medicine, like some people are better at procedures, like Kim, you did, and Chris, you both did a lot of procedures. So uh, it would, and even though it's primary care, certain of the clinicians were good at this or that, and we would tend to cross-refer to each other. Doing that. So what has been your experience, Pat, as far as if you get a referral from your primary care physician, getting, you know, uh, that covered? by insurance? Well, in terms of your needs as the client, you don't have to worry. We take the financial hit if it doesn't get paid. You, we, no one's ever paid a dollar out of their pocket for any of our services. Now, plenty of people have given us nice donations, but we didn't specifically demand that for service. They were all voluntary donations. But no one's paid a nickel uh, out of their own pocket. We take what insurance gives us, which isn't very much. And again, we have to fix that. That's not feasible for the long term. Did I cover that well enough, Chris? Yeah, we get that question many times here. And so um, uh, just to repeat, we're not going to give you names of anyone in particular. Talk to your primary care doctor. They can refer you to neurology or to Dr. Zook's clinic. You can go, you can self-refer as well. Um, Another question um, 
this is, I'm going to change the subject a little bit. So I recently read a book called Together by uh, Dr. Vivek Murthy, who is the um, Surgeon General in the U.S. And he is also just this week, I think, coming out with a big U.S. plan. Um, the idea is that loneliness is really killing us. <laughs> and if nothing we learned from the pandemic, it was that um, not having social interaction was really hard on our mental health, even our physical health, and our memory. Um, can you talk a little bit about the research in that? It's very extensive now. In the pandemic, really brought this out. The problem is loneliness is something we don't want to admit to. We don't want to admit to loneliness because we're ashamed of that. And that's, that's a barrier. That's a big barrier to solving that. And what we're finding, you know, as I mentioned before, the three-hour discussions that we have for our evaluation, people are so, it's pent up lonely. They just like talking with someone who, some nice person talking to you is really solving that. But loneliness affects you uh, in so many ways. It can lead to depression. It can lead to anxiety. Depression can physically incapacitate you, make it hard for you to exercise. You don't exercise, you don't sleep as good. You don't sleep as good, all sorts of other mayhem, your blood pressure goes up, things doctors can measure, your blood sugar goes up because you're stressed. So um, loneliness is part of the pandemic and that backwash is gonna go on for years. Because here's the deal, when you're 22 and you get out of college or 21 and you get out of college, you got all kinds of friends, you can figure it out, or you could move to another city and develop a culture of friends. Most 22 year olds can do that. I'll tell you when you're 82 and you've been holed up in your house for two or three years, it's hard to go out and reestablish those relationships, calling and getting called, meeting, book groups, all sorts of things. And so why not just go over to Whitney? I know it's a program it's put on and people don't like being part of a program, but Whitney has all kinds of events where you can sit and talk to people. What's not to like about that? I, we think faith groups can be a great collaboration for us. And we don't say churches, we say faith groups because sometimes there are mosques or there's other names for it. But faith groups, if we can convince the faith group leaders to foster a visiting uh, a group of volunteers, visiting those who are older, living isolated. Do you realize that 25% of the people with dementia in Minnesota live alone? 25% live alone? Now maybe their daughter and their son live on the same street and stop by every day, but they're living alone. I think the churches, our, our church even had a, a visit people I forget what they called it. We had visiting nurses. We had the parish nurse concept, which was good. Um, and my friends who do delivered home uh, delivered meals, they say people are grateful for the meal, but they really want to sit down and talk. <laughs> so they deliver the mac and cheese, and it gets cold sitting there while they're talking, because what they really wanted was somebody to talk to. Like, oh my gosh. But it's hard to go out and reestablish, especially when the pandemic has thrown us off kilter, off the track of social calling, being called, and all that. And it's, it just sucks the life out of people. So how do you tell someone they're a little bit defensive about, you know, you're accusing me of being lonely? I've got friends. I've got lots of friends, you know. My daughter in Chicago, she calls me like every month. So, um, but you know, we're defensive about loneliness. So it's hard to approach. And, you know, as a physician, there's nothing more frustrating than seeing a problem, knowing how to take care of it, but not being allowed in. The patient puts up a barrier and doesn't allow you in. And quite often it's due to denial or just feeling, you know, kind of embarrassed about it. So I think it's incumbent on faith groups to do that. Not everyone has a faith group. So other, like Whitney Senior Center is another fabulous resource. Not every city of our size has a, a resource like that. 
or uh, go to concerts. A lot of people, we have these summer by, summertime by George concerts, you know, and it's outdoors. So if you're worried about COVID, it's outdoors. I think it's a little bit safer and they have nice music and so forth. Um, somebody asked a question about anesthesia. So that will kind of lead us into the toxin question. I don't know if you're addressing that later or if you want to tackle that now. Well, the, um, so a risk factor for dementia is having multiple general anesthetics, multiple. So, um, so when, you, when you go to have surgery and you're going to have a general anesthetic, the anesthesiologist or the anesthetist will talk to you. Do you have any concerns? That's when you say, how are you going to protect my brain during surgery? Because if they let, if they just keep your oxygen normal, but they let the carbon dioxide get too high, that could cause a problem. When the carbon dioxide gets too high, you go into acidosis, bad things happen. Uh, the people that I've seen do anesthesia in St. Cloud do a fine job. So I'm not worried about that, but um, it's good to challenge them. When they say, okay, I'm gonna put you to sleep, I'm the one that's gonna do that, do you have any concerns? They'll say, are you allergic to anything? And of course you wanna mention, many people get horrible retching when they wake up because they get narcotics during the surgery. Well, give me the one that doesn't do retching, and they will. <laughs> you just have to ask for it. People have no idea that you can do a la carte anesthesia. You know, just say, well, you know, I threw up a lot and I want you to prevent that. But just say, what are you gonna do to protect my brain? That gets in their head like, oh, they're thinking about that. And I think that's probably all you need to do. And if you need open heart surgery, you need open heart surgery. You don't not do open heart surgery because you're worried it might contribute to dementia risk. But if you can do it uh, with a local, um, maybe you wanna try that. So like your foot surgeries, your knees, they're even doing hips. The problem with a local anesthetic when you do a hip, I know when I had my hip replaced, they said, you know, it was barely, I don't know, four or six hours after the surgery, oh, we're gonna get out of bed now. I said, we are? <laughs> like, really? Well, you can if your hip's awake. But if you had a spinal, you couldn't do that. You would have to wait until your legs aren't floppy anymore that you can feel your feet on the ground before you can start rehabbing. And I believe in rehab as soon as possible after surgery. But if you can get a, a local or regional anesthetic without the general, and it's feasible and your surgeon's okay with it, I think that's a good consideration. Um, and there are reasons why you'd rather have a general than local, but probably for another discussion. But um, if you've already had the surgeries, we can't go back and change that. But what we can do is maybe, if we have that as a risk factor, double down on the things that might happen. Uh, that are similar. So if you have untreated sleep apnea, we will get to talking about that. That's one of the biggest factors we see. 50% of people who have sleep apnea don't know they have it. And What's sleep apnea? Sleep apnea is a condition where you, um, for various reasons, usually obstruction in the back of your throat from soft tissue that collapses when you sleep and it causes you to get low oxygen during your sleep time. Oxygen normally is 98%, it can go down into the 80s. And your brain does not like low oxygen. So low oxygen is bad for the brain. And um, in sleep apnea, it's only during the slow wave sleep, it's usually a two, hour, two or three hour window. But if you have low oxygen to your brain for two or three hours every night, imagine what that does to your brain. It's not good. And it's very treatable. I mean, you wear a device, it's, you see it on TV, they make fun of it all the time because now they want you to get a surgical procedure that is like a pacemaker in your throat. Talk to someone who had the pacemaker in your throat and see how much pain they had with that. It ain't much fun. But um, we, ha we have another question about water and hydration. And then there was a question about if medications are water or fat soluble. I'm not sure if that was specifically for um, vitamins, is no, what I would No, it's for statins. Oh. So I make a big deal out of this. And, and uh, statin drugs for cholesterol, and I think it's a controversial subject. And if you're related to a pharmaceutical rep, it's very controversial. But um, people who have high cholesterol who have, are substantial risk for coronary artery disease are on a statin. However, there's a lot of people who don't have substantial coronary artery disease risk and are on a statin. 
because the guidelines say that your bad cholesterol, your LDL, should be below 130. Well, people on statins are being put on statins for an LDL of 135. Before any discussion of changing your diet, your exercise, your sleep habits, your social habits, and on and on and stress. Uh, and you know, it's really easy. I can write a prescription for statin in less than three minutes, but to sit down and talk about those other things requires a half an hour. So which am I gonna do if I'm a clinician? You know, most of the time, I just write the statin, here, take this. Uh, but there are two kinds of statins. Those that are fat soluble, and your brain is two thirds fat. Fat soluble medications get into your brain. And water-soluble ones theoretically don't. They do sometimes, but mostly they don't get into your brain. Statins, when they were first invented, caused a lot of cognitive dysfunction as a side effect. And it just turns out, in my personal opinion, the fat-soluble ones are more likely to do that because they get into your brain, and the water-soluble ones don't. The water-soluble ones are pravastatin and rosuvastatin, so pravacol and crestor. Uh, the other ones are mostly fat-soluble ones. So in our, in, when we do our evaluations, we make recommendations. We generally recommend, if this person really needs a statin, please consider switching to an equivalent dose, an equally effective water-soluble one. Now, you could argue against that. As I said, almost anything we say here, there'll be people that argue the opposite. Uh, but that's what they mean by water-soluble. Hello? This is also a really good time to remind you not to change your medicines without talking to your doctor. <laughs> yeah, please, please don't stop it because it, without talking it over. But I think, I know we were kind of brainwashed to think that everyone needs a statin and every medical problem is simply absence of the right pill. That's the answer. Water, which is I'm sorry. Well, preferably, I prefer the water-soluble ones. And the reason being that they don't get into the brain as much, we think, uh, and are less likely to cause cognitive dysfunction. And I think any of the statins is capable of cognitive dys dysfunction, but it's by no means does it do that in every person. You can take statins your whole life and never have any cognitive deficit. The problem is, when you come into your doc family doctor's office time after time, when did they do a detailed three-hour cognitive assessment to see if the statin's causing you a deficit. They don't, they can't. And so your deficit, if you're a teacher, it'll take 10 years for any deficit to show. You have a fabulous, active, resilient mind. You're not gonna show that. Our, our tests for cognitive dysfunction are crude instruments. They don't pick up a little bit of cognitive failure very well. And so nobody does that. I've, I've never seen a heart doctor have cognitive testing done on a regular basis because 80% of their patients are on statins. But they don't do cognitive testing. And if you're a, a very knowledgeable, active brain person, it's gonna be forever before that shows up because you've got a lot of cognitive reserve, as they say. Pat, just another, you talked a little bit about insurance coverage for you know the dementia care. Another question comes here is, What's been your experience with health insurance companies for the cost of home care or support for family caregivers? Well, uh, support services, Tammy and Christina could tell you more about that. They're really up on that. But generally speaking, when we do our evaluations, we have to show that you have deficit written in that to allow for coverage to happen. They want to see you as sicker than well, well, if you're well, they don't want to pay for it. So we don't mean to be critical in our reports when they say so-and-so has this deficit and that deficit, and their activities of daily living are inadequate for this and for that. But that's what it takes to get coverage. If you don't look bad enough in the report, they're not going to pay for it. They may, they may not pay for it anyway. Hi, Tammy Kobinger here from the Central Minnesota Dementia Community Action Network and the Dementia Resource Center Clinic in St. Cloud. I'm here today to talk to you about personalized dementia care. We've seen too many families receive a diagnosis of dementia and hear, there's nothing we can do, come back in a year. 
a loved one receives a dementia diagnosis, but the family and patients receive no direction on what to do next or suggestions for dementia-related services available. Families and patients feel helpless and struggle to find hope. We believe that collaborating with a patient, their family, and their dementia clinician can slow and even halt the progression of dementia symptoms leading to more life to live. How do we do that? It's a step-by-step -step process at the Dementia Resource Center Clinic. We start with a thorough dementia risk assessment and evaluation, then formulate a diagnosis and a management plan. A patient's referring primary care and specialty clinicians remain in charge of their care but we partner with them to provide a more thorough and successful management plan. We provide personalized recommendations for diet, exercise, sleep, relaxation, social connections, health habits, and therapeuticals to slow and even halt the progression of dementia symptoms. We provide patients with regular follow-ups and we provide caregivers and families with educational sessions, support services, and prevention strategies to partner in their loved one's progress. Hi, I'm Christina with the Dementia Resource Center Clinic in St. Cloud. I wanna tell you a little bit about our dementia caregiver support group that we offer every month. We have five locations throughout central Minnesota. The third Tuesday of every month, we meet in St. Cloud at 10 a.m. The fourth Tuesday of every month, we're in Staples, Minnesota at 9 a.m. Wadena, Minnesota at 11 a.m. And the fourth Tuesday of every month at 2 p.m. we're in Long Prairie, Minnesota. Our fifth option for support groups is gonna be the fourth Wednesday of every month at 10 a.m. in Becker, Minnesota. We would love to have you join us at any of these support groups. If you have any questions or wanna find out more information about our support groups or about other services that we provide at the Dementia Resource Center Clinic, please visit our website at www.dcan-mn.org. Hi, this is Christina from the Dementia Resource Center Clinic. I wanted to take a little time to share some information about the caregiving coaching services that we offer. You can receive personalized one-on-one -on -one caregiver coaching to equip yourself with the knowledge, skills, and tools to care for yourself and your loved one living with dementia. Our goal is to enrich the role of a caregiver and equip them to become a stronger caregiver capable of self-directed care. You will gain tools to assist you in the caregiving role, such as education for dementia risk factor improvement, setting reasonable, realistic, and attainable goals, developing effective coping skills, setting realistic boundaries, identifying areas in which the caregiver could use additional help, providing additional resources, affirming the caregiver's strengths and accomplishments, reducing caregiver stress by developing coping strategies and assistance in problem solving. Hi, my name is Kay. I've been a volunteer with uh, DCAN for approximately six months. Uh, I'm, I'm here to speak to you about the Dementia Informed Counseling. It's a new service that will be coming on board shortly. And what it does is, is it gives you an avenue for hope and insight and um, to the life of the couple or the family. Dementia is a, a disease and like many diseases, it upsets the apple cart. There are many emotions that go into dealing with any kind of illness, but dementia especially is difficult. It, it can help get the relationship back on track with new understanding and a little uh, professional guidance. Each counseling session will help the person living with dementia, the caregiver, and or the family member. They'll hopefully reconnect with different viewpoints, but with the same amount of love as before the dementia. Counselors will take a positive and constructive approach in identifying solutions and give, hopefully, a, a doable and beneficial outcome for everyone involved. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Julie Schomer with the Home for the Day Adult Day Center. We operate out of Love of Christ Church in St. Cloud, Minnesota, off of Pinecone Road. We provide a fun and safe place for seniors to socialize and enjoy a variety of activities. Caregivers love our program because they can get a much needed break while their loved one is with us. We are very supportive of DCAN because they're doing important work around educating and supporting people affected by dementia. So we want to talk about nutrition, brain health. You're going to see lots of um, seminars, webinars, all sorts of educational things on nutrition and brain health. Um, as I said, you know, when we were in medical school, we didn't get much training on that. So what most clinicians know about nutrition is pretty much what they learned on their own efforts. However, um, what, what gets me concerned is the standards that we have for nutrition in this country. The standards are written by large groups of people who are gathered together. I'm not sure who's the boss of those groups, but there's usually 30 or 40 professionals get together and decide what everyone should eat or shouldn't eat. And those standards, usually USDA, and the panels that are, that are people deciding what we should eat or recommend we eat are made up of people mostly from the food industry, Nestle's, uh, General Mills, or the pharmaceutical industry. So do we want the food industry to tell us what foods we should eat? Do we think that's a good idea? Because whenever people talk nutrition, they say, follow the money. And uh, I hate to say it's probably true in nutrition as much as anything. So in our program, I really, really would love to find a nutritionist or two that we could refer our clients to. But the ones that exist, uh, it would take me a long time to vet them to know what they know. Um, but what the real registered licensed nutritionists have to say is what the USDA recommendations are. And the USDA recommendations are that you need at least 40% of your calories from carbohydrates, preferably 60%. And you need 10% of your calories from sugar. Well, what I read is humans do not need a single grain of sugar. We can exist without a single grain of sugar. But somebody who had input on the recommendation said you need 10%. There it is. And so I have a real problem with trying to get people guided on nutrition. Uh, we're busy dealing with uh, nutrition, much of what our evaluation covers. So um, what I'm about to say in this uh, next uh, 45 minutes or so is a reflection of that concern. So in, you know, as I said, people want you to teach um, evidence-based medicine to get approval for three hours of continuing medical education credit for this meeting, 
I had to prove that what I'm saying is medically credible. And they want you to have evidence base. Now, I can bend the rules a little bit, but um, if we only do what has already been done, are we going to improve? If we never innovate, are we going to improve? I think not. And our current system is not working. Complex medical care is getting out of hand. And nobody wants to do complex medical care. 10 diagnoses, 15 drugs, that's complicated complex medical care. You lose your shirt doing that if you do that business, unless you charge cash at a boutique med medicine clinic. Now, we don't want to be a, a boutique medicine clinic. We want to treat everybody. But we need to have, find a way that everyone can get treated. But nutrition is uh, ever evolving. I change my opinion on things every year or so. New things are saying, no, that's good, no, that's bad, no, that's good, no, that's bad. And remember, anything I say here today where I'm suggesting that it's a good thing may not be right for you. If I tell you to eat green leafy things and you're on Coumadin, that's not a good idea. Coumadin works by binding vitamin K so it cannot work. And that's how it keeps your blood thin. And so people on Coumadin, uh, dicumarol, there's several names for Coumadin, um, should not eat green leafy things unless their doctor approves it. So there's a lot of controversy in nutrition. Kim and I just listened to an online webinar, actually a eight or so lecture series on food. And this uh, guy was push, pushing uh, plant-based whole foods only. No animal products whatsoever. I personally don't believe in that. The people we see are mostly 65 years of age and older. And when you speak medically about recommendations based on guidelines, the guidelines are based on people mostly studied who are between ages of 35 and 55. Well, we don't, we don't see very many of those folks. So our recommendations are specifically tailored to the age group and the sex of the person we're talking to. So it's hard to make recommendations that blanket good, this is blanket good for everybody. Although there's a few like that. I can't think of any good reason why blueberries would be bad for somebody. I'm sure somebody will come up with, oh, you get a blueberry piece on your teeth, <laughs> and you give a big talk, and you got a little piece of blueberry on your teeth, like Rosanna Denna, remember her? Uh, you got that little piece of blueberry. But, um, but global recommendations are difficult. So in our two to three hour evaluations, we talk nutrition quite a bit. And it's nutrition according to what I believe, and what I believe is sifted through hours and hours reading books like these, and lots of articles and so forth. So that's what I'm gonna give you today. So I'm gonna nerd out just a little bit here and talk about this as a neuron cell. In your brain, this is the workhorse cell in your brain and there are many different kinds of neurons. So I'm gonna just describe to you the generic neuron. In your brain, there's somewhere between 85 and 120 billion of these. They're vital. They're all interconnected. See those little spikules going out all over? They're interconnected way more than this illustration shows. And in the center is a nucleus that has the genetic material. Those little green jelly beans are mitochondria, the energy forming packets inside your cell. And this is a way underrepresented because the artist needed to leave room. But in a nerve cell, a brain cell, there's probably 3,000 mitochondria in each one. The job of the mitochondria is to provide energy for metabolic function of this cell. This cell will die if it doesn't have enough energy. Where does it get its energy from? Glucose comes through the cell and penetrates through the cell wall, is brought in. Oxygen comes in, and that's necessary as well. Glucose doesn't get through the cell unless you have insulin that's working. And insulin doesn't work unless you have something called nitric oxide to make the insulin work. The final common pathway in almost all of us with dementia is that doesn't work. The cells forget how to use glucose, which is the basic fuel. It also can use ketones, which we'll discuss. But glucose, for most of us, is the basic fuel. Glucose, however, is crude oil. 
And you can't put crude oil in your car to get the engine. You have to refine that. And that's what the mitochondria do. They convert that crude oil, which is glucose, into ATP, which is the rocket fuel for your nerve cells and other cells in your body. Which cells in your body have the most mitochondria? Heart and brain. Your brain never stops. Even when you're sleeping, your brain is still working. Your heart never stops or you stop. And so mitochondria are very important in those cells. And a lot of people think that dementia, no matter what kind, or neurodegenerative uh, disease, and there are many diseases that have different names, but the final common pathway, energy failure in the neuron cell. And as I said, there are many brands of neurons. There's different kinds that do different things. But in general, uh, Dr. Bredesen describes it as network failure. Each one of these 85 billion, 100 billion, they're all interconnected to each other. It's a redundant network. And Dr. Bredesen describes all neurodegeneration as network failure. And if the, each cell is starting to underperform, it doesn't transmit the impulses, it's still sucking up oxygen, still sucking up the crude oil, glucose, but not doing its work, there's a kill switch and it's killed. It has a autophagy which kills it. You might say, well, that's gonna be bad. Well, just think of how you prune an apple tree. Apple tree won't produce if it has all kinds of sucker branches. You have to prune those. Well, think of this as pruning. Your brain is fabulous. The reason it takes 30 years for you to get symptoms from when the process starts is because there's this autophagy, this killing off of the, the slow ones that aren't doing the job. And that's, that's how we don't get symptoms for 30 years. Well, a million years ago, people didn't live beyond age 30 or 40, so it wasn't really necessary that you have this. But um, our diet today is causing energy failure in our neurons. And it doesn't matter if you're calling it Parkinson's or if you're calling it MS or if you're calling it uh, Huntington's Korea or some other name, it's nerve failure. The, the neuron cells fail. They don't get enough energy and quite often they get the kill switch and they die. So we didn't learn any of that in medical school. That was, but, um, and I'm just nerding out on this one cell here uh, because that's real important for what I'm gonna say about nutrition. So our meds for d dementia, in my opinion, really don't work that good. And I know the Alzheimer's Association people are here and they really believe in drugs, but in our experience, they don't work that good. And in fact, when you look at the studies on hundreds of thousands of people who took the most popular uh, dementia drug, their brains deteriorated faster than the control group that didn't take anything. So that's discouraging to me. You know, I was raised in medical school, which taught me that Every disease is just absence of the right drug and drugs are where it's at and you could write a prescription in three minutes and take care of everything. Uh, but in dementia, it's not true. So wouldn't prevention be a better card to play in this um, system of trying to deal with dementia? Prevention is way better. And you know, we as Americans, we've come to you know, the, the quintessential American investment in their own health is the overhead drone view of someone driving through the COVID line. They just stick their arm out the window, get a shot and on their way. That's the extent of most of our efforts to help our own health. We can do better than that and we need to do better. And this is something you can do whether your clinician has time to tell you this or not. You can do this. And even if you don't have dementia, you can do it so you don't get dementia. I believe that that's true. No. You can't, they always say you can't run away from a bad diet. Well, you can't diet your way away from dementia risk. You need a good diet, but you need to do all the other things that we're gonna talk about. You need to exercise, you need to keep your weight down. You need to get proper sleep. If you have sleep apnea, you get a treat. You need to quit smoking. You need to work on social interaction and fight that loneliness. If you have depression, get it treated. Uh, so nutrition is a big part of this. But if you don't do all the rest of it, you know, eating uh, kale is going to save you. you know, even when you get those stems stuck in your teeth, it's not going to save you. Um, you need to do the whole package is the point. 
We become what we eat. I've heard people say that, and I always was mystified by that. But in your brain, in that nerve cell that we uh, talked about, there's, imagine there's a, a team all around the membrane. And each day it takes the bricks that that membrane is made out of and gets rid of the bad ones, grabs what's ever available, and sticks another one in there. Those are fat molecules. And if they re reach out and grab a bad fat molecule like omega-6, that's like putting a hand grenade in your brick wall. It oxidizes quickly and will create brain inflammation and lead to dementia. Every day your brain, each cell membrane, of each and every neuron is substituting out the ones that are nearly oxidized and reaching whatever is available and putting it back into the brick wall of your, of your membrane of your brain cell. And if all that's available is omega-6 from the bag of chips that's cooked in corn oil or some other seed oil, the, those are packed with omega-6s. Uh, even olive oil has a little bit of omega-6, but the omega-3 is way better. Omega-3 is good. Omega-6, not so good. Now, you need omega-6. It's obligate. You have to have some omega-6. But you can get all the omega-6 you need without even trying. You don't have to worry about that. But this is one principle of nutrition that you should all read about and learn about. And I finally found, you know, because I, I go through the chip aisle all the time looking at the vet products to see what's, and they're cooking them in avocado oil. Yeah. Finally, there's not, and avocado's a fruit, it's not a seed. And olive is a fruit and not a seed. So if it's cooked, now it's expensive to cook it in real olive oil. And avocado oil and, and uh, olive oil are best, but you know, you've got a better than even chance that what you picked up that says avocado oil, that's not really avocado oil. Better than even chance when you pick up and it says olive oil, it's not really olive oil. It may be 10 or 20% olive oil, but the rest is rapeseed oil canola oil, which is loaded with omega-6s, which the guy, the guy that's building your cell wall is going to grab those omega-6s and stick it in there. It's like putting a hand grenade in your wall instead of a brick. And think of it that way. I think that's easier nutrition. Now, this is nerding out, and I'm getting into the molecules, which my colleagues always kid me about. But you know, if you know why you don't want to eat chips cooked in an omega-6 oil, it's easier to pass that by and not have those chips. Or at least look for the ones that says avocado oil. I don't know if it really cooked in avocado oil. I'd have to see it to believe it. But um, there was a whole thing on 60 Minutes about the um, counterfeit olive oil. It started in Italy. And you know if you can get $50 a bottle for olive oil, and you can make it 80% rapeseed oil and still call it olive oil. Even in the restaurant, when you say, I want olive oil, they only, if it's 51% olive oil, they can call it olive oil. That's the rule. So rapeseed oil, canola oil, is high in omega-6s. It oxidizes easily. Oxidation leads to inflammation. Inflammation tears down those cells that we showed you. Omega-6, you'll get all the omega-6 you want just being an American. You don't have to go out and look for it. And the big thing is omega-6s, will lower your bad cholesterol, which is like the golden, what do they call that? The what? Omega-3. Well, well, no, the omega-6 is the one that will um, actually, it'll actually lower your bad cholesterol. Now, that's not true of omega-3s. Omega-3s sometimes can raise your LDL cholesterol. But we, as doctors, were trained, elevated LDL cholesterol equals death. Not so. Not so. And that's heresy to say that. If you said that at a cardiology convention, you'd be shot. <laughs> so when, the, when you go to the canola guy and you say, well, I'm not going to use your seed oil anymore, he says, yeah, but it lowers your LDL cholesterol. Yeah, but does it make you live longer? No, but it lowers your LDL cholesterol. So we have to get away from that. And some of the good things that I would recommend, the omega-3s, may raise your LDL slightly. It doesn't happen in everybody, but some people it does. Uh, like um, we recommend a lot of people use coconut oil to saute things. It's a lot of saturated fat. It has very little linoleic acid. It's very unlikely to cause oxidation and damage. And actually, it helps you develop ketones in your blood, which is the other rocket fuel. Ketones gets into your cell. It's rocket fuel right away. It doesn't need to be converted by those jelly bean mitochondria. 
So, um, and that's a whole other thing, talking about ketones as alternative fuel. You know, as we get older, we don't do as well utilizing sugar for fuel. That's, and they do an FDG glucose scan to see where in your brain sugar isn't being utilized. It's a test, $6,000 or something. Um, but um, your brain never forgets how to use ketones. And what are ketones? Well, ketones is an alternative uh, fuel source. When you absorb body fat, when you dissolve body fat because you don't eat for 14 hours, you're bringing ketones into your blood. You bring ketones into your blood when you saute your uh, spinach in coconut oil, or when you add MCT powder to your coffee to whiten it. You're, uh, you're increasing the ketones in your blood, and your brain never forgets how to use ketones for rocket fuel. Even if you're 120 years old, ketones works right away as instant fuel. And so people say, well, why is it a, a low carb, even ketogenic diet good? Well, there's a lot of things um, that it pushes your brain towards using ketones where it now fails to utilize glucose. That's a small part of it. It does a bunch of other things too. You're gonna to hear people talk about bad things in your blood that result from digestion of food. T-M-A-O uh, is trimethylamine oxide. When you eat red meat, when you eat eggs, when you eat cheese, T-M-A-O goes up. But it only goes up because the germs, the good germs, not so good germs in our intestine convert the protein the amino acids, particular ones, in the red meat, the eggs, or the animal products, into TMAO. But then it goes to your liver and it turns into something with the O on the end of it, which is bad for you, contributes to heart disease and all that. However, there's many ways you can reduce that. So the people that tell you you can't eat any meat, you can't have any eggs, you can't have any dairy, I don't agree with that. Because I think you can overcome arguments like the TMAO argument with other things nutrition-wise. If you take a person who's been on a very low-carb diet for a while and you give them a steak, they hardly make any TMAO. So there's ways around that. So Kim and I just listened to, uh, I don't know if you did all of them, but I did four or five of them, talking about TMAO and why uh, meat is not so good for you, but I don't agree with that. But I did, as I mentioned before, I recommend if you have beef, it'd be grass-fed beef. And so um, it turns out that the financial powers of the food industry, and you know, if you look at profit margins of all the industries in the United States, one of the biggest profit margins is the food industry. Who would have thought? Followed closely by the drug industry and several others in between. They make a huge profit. And they, how do they make a profit? By making things taste good. And they make a profit by making the cereal boxes so thin they look like a book you know, on your shelf, uh, making the smaller contents and so forth. Um, but uh, the wrong people are having an influence on what we eat and how we eat. When you go to the grocery store, if you look at all the products in the grocery store, more than 50% of them have added sugar. And what's worse than sugar? High fructose corn syrup. High fructose corn syrup. It tastes really sweet. It's dirt cheap, has an eternal half-life. It works really good in a product and people buy the food because it tastes so darn good. Why does barbecue sauce taste so good? It's half sugar. It's sweet and sweet sells. And so their profit margin is maintained by you buying the salad dressing that's got high fructose corn syrup, uh, it's the barbecue sauce, it's all kinds of other uh, picani sauce or whatever, it, and there's a lot of sweetness in there. It's just really hard to get new ideas to catch on. There's no um, cachet to having a new way of eating. It's not like, uh, um, who's the big uh, concert person that, the lady? Uh, Gaga? Not Lady Gaga, but uh, <laughs> the one that they, they sold all the tickets in one day. Oh, Taylor. Who? Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. 
Yeah, now that garners attention. You know, it's a Taylor Swift kind of, people talk about that, but you don't talk about a low carb diet preserving your brain. It just doesn't have the, the glitziness. You know, people like to talk about stuff that's really glitzy, but. Um, so new ideas in terms of uh, food don't catch on very well. And then there's so much controversy because anybody and his brother can make a production and put it on the internet and it looks like an authority. And maybe it's not so good. Doesn't matter, they can still put it on the internet. You can go look at it. It's sort of like politicians, they all argue all sides of the story so much and after a while you're so confused, you don't know what to vote for. And it works, it works. So I want to talk about a couple of molecules. And again, my, my uh, colleagues are going to kid me, but I'm, I'm extracting two tiny little things to talk about in particular that very much has to do with nutrition and probably has to do with almost every inflammatory condition you can think of. Coronary artery disease is, I consider, an inflammatory condition. Rheumatoid arthritis, any arthritis, any inflammatory colitis, you name it, and it has inflammation at its core. And metabolism that gets messed up can have markers like uric acid. Uric acid used to be tested uh, in the lab routinely. It was part of a chemical profile because it was a gout causer. It causes gout, particularly in men, but it can happen in women. Certain drugs can raise your uric acid. And when we do our evaluations, we always ask the referring clini clinician Please do a uric acid. It used to be done automatically almost every time you did a blood test. But hardly anybody talks about gout anymore because we have drugs that treat gout pretty well. Allopurinol is the first line. But uh, one of the uh, books, um, this one here by Richard Johnson, he's also a um, archeologist and looks into ancient humans and so forth. A couple million years ago, hominid, our hominid ancestors developed a lack of an enzyme called uricase so that they could survive the winter. And lacking that caused your uric acid to go up and caused you to metabolize differently so that you would get, uh, when you'd eat all the fruits in the fall, you would get a lot of fructose in your blood, which broke down in your liver into uric acid and triglycerides. The triglycerides went into body fat. And it turns out if you've got a lot of body fat, you're more likely to survive the deprivation of winter. There was a reason for that. And several other hominids, not humans, but they have the same mutation at the same time in history. And usually that's an advantage when multiple organisms get the same mutation. Now, if you go to the zoo and you draw the blood of a gorilla, their uric acid will be three or less. You get the average man on the street, it'll be 6.5 or seven. And the book, or actually when you do the lab test, they put the normal afterwards. And the normal is considered anything below seven. Anywhere from 5.5 to seven, you're, you have excess uric acid. Not enough to cause gout. Gout is a real painful joint at the base of your big toe for most people. It can be in your knee or other. Any joint that's cooler than the rest of your body can get gout. It's red, it's swollen, it's hot, it's tender. A bed sheet can't even touch it. That's how bad gout is. So it's good to prevent gout. But that's the least of your worries with uric acid. Uric acid hurts your blood vessels. And what's bad for your blood vessels is bad for your brain. And so that's why I think it's so important to know what your uric acid is. And your doctor will say, oh, you're normal at 6.5. Well, I've heard that anything above 5 or 5.5, it's hurting my blood vessels. I don't want any of my blood vessels to be bad. And there are over-the-counter ways to treat uric acid, but um, allopurinol is mostly safe. There's a rare occasional side effect. It's a generically available medication and it will very effectively lower most people's uric acid. Quercetin, which you can buy over the counter, does the same thing, but don't mess with anything like that until you talk to your doctor about it. But you don't want your uric acid to be above 5.5. And I think it's very important for vascular health. And the reason it's important is because it toxifies and prevents the formation of nitric oxide, which is the next molecule I'm gonna talk about. Nitric oxide deficiency. It's 11. And we have the, um, the 
exhibits at 11.15. So I just wanted to give you a time frame. We have 15 minutes. Well, if you want questions afterwards, you got five. I, I can burn through this in five minutes, so I'll do it. But you need to know that fructose is bad. You say, well, there's fructose in my apple. Well, that's okay because the fiber of the skin will slow the absorption of fructose. Don't worry about that. But the apple juice, you can drink 18 ounces of apple juice and your fructose goes to the moon because you drink it fast. And that's not what you want to do. You don't want fruit juices, but you do want to eat the apple. Don't worry about the little bit. Now, if you ate 30 apples, okay, maybe we'll get a big load of fructose. But we were kids, we'd go and pick apples at the orchard, and I think my brother and I would eat about 15 apples. And we didn't realize we were hurting our brain when we did that, but it was a lot of fun. But if your blood glucose gets above 120, after a meal, it's not impossible. In fact, most of us Americans over 50 have insulin resistance, and we're over 120 quite a bit of the day after a meal. When it goes over 120, your metabolism shifts the glucose into fructose. Fructose goes to your liver, creates uric acid, and get, makes you fat by giving you more triglycerides to store right here in preference, the belly fat. So fructose, not so good. Uh, and what uric acid does, it toxifies the blood vessels directly by tying up your production, preventing your production, neutralizing the nitric oxide that you do make in your blood vessels. And that's my next molecule. Well, first of all, uh, these are two books that we have up here, and we're going to have a drawing about that. Nature Wants Us to Be Fat by Dr. Johnson and Dr. David Perlmutter, who's a neurologist. He has a, a podcast called The Empowering Neurologist. He doesn't mean LSD acid. He means dropping uric acid, but catchy name for a book. So nitric oxide, it's in every blood vessel. Your blood vessels make nitric oxide until you're 40 years old. And then it starts to drop off, such that by the time you're 65, you're only making 20% of the nitric oxide you need for good blood vessel health. If your blood vessels are unhealthy, you'll have hypertension. You'll have more vascular disease. You need nitric oxide. And you get nitric oxide by two ways, only two ways. One is your blood vessels make it, and the other is from what you eat. And what you eat needs to contain nitrates. The nitrates in the greens, or beets, it hits the good germs in the back of your tongue. Who would have thought the germs in the back of your tongue was necessary to make nitric oxide or to help you in any way? But you need those germs. And those germs take the nitrate in the plant, convert it to nitrate, send it to your stomach. And if your stomach has acid, it converts the process, sends it back to your salivary glands. And every time you swallow, you get more nitric oxide as a result. It's complicated. But if you kill those germs, and how do you kill those germs? What mouthwash kills 99.99% .99 of the germs? People who do that regularly have 30% more hypertension and an increased risk of dementia by 30%. Daily use of mouthwash that's antiseptic. Now, there are some that are just perfumed. But the ones that are antiseptic and use it regularly, you've, you've got an increased risk for dementia. And, and your blood vessels won't be as healthy. And if your blood vessels are unhealthy, what's bad for the blood vessels? Bad for the brain, right? So, and by the time we're older, after age 65, we don't make much nitric oxide and we require the, the foods that have nitrates in it. And they've tested the foods in Chicago. They're different than the foods in California. It's different from the foods in Florida. Nitrate is all over the chart. And if you grow your greens in depleted soil, you won't have much of this in it. If you grow your greens in healthy soil that's had good farming methods to maintain the quality of the soil, you'll have way more nitrate. So there are greens and then there's greens. Depends where they were raised and how they were raised. I think I got most of that. So this system of making more nitric oxide won't work if you take an antacid, proton pump inhibitor. It won't work if you use mouthwash. And um, exercise does promote nitric oxide. So we always wonder, why is exercise so good for us? Well, it promotes the formation of nitric oxide. 
which is good for your blood vessels, which is good for your brain. Anything that's good for your blood vessels is good for your brain. And it gets back to nitric oxide. Never taught us that in medical school. Uh, here's the book uh, by Dr. Bryan, who's a PhD, writes extensively, and that's one of the books we're gonna give away, but I'd recommend it. It's only about 100 pages, and it's, it's written in a, a, a style that most of us can understand. But nitric oxide is, they're looking to way you can take supplements of nitric oxide. You know, there was a pill that was being used for in an experimental trial for uh, primary pulmonary hypertension. That's an exotic heart condition. At the end of the study, none of the men would give the pills back. That pill was sildenafil, which is Viagra. And it was used to treat primary pulmonary hypertension uh, because it puts a lot of nitric oxide into the circulation. But it works better if you um, have the proper diet and you exercise and all the other things. But they're looking to get supplements, which would be sodium nitroxide, they call it, or something else, where you can build it, but you can't cheat. You still need to exercise. So what should we be eating? I'm glad you asked that question. I have a slide for that. <laughs> oh, you're good, Kim. So um, I think that animal products are okay in moderation, uh, but um, I have no problem with avocados. If you eat an avocado a day, um, I can't see that would be a problem as long as you can accommodate the calories. Avocado is a fruit. It's a really good thing. I think vegetables, especially the dark greens, those are all good. Uh, the non-starchy vegetables. I don't eat much potatoes anymore. I do eat yams, the ones that are purple on the outside and orange on the inside. My wife and I will split one of those and cook it in the air fryer once a week or so. Color is good. Anything that's brightly colored is good. Get the onions that are red or purple on the outside, not the white ones. Color is good. If it's organic and it's really organic, I'd recommend that because you're less likely to have glyphosate, which is Roundup on it, or other pesticides or things. So if it's really organic, I'd say go for it. A lot of times it's really not organic. But if it is, that would be better. It's a little more expensive. The, the fruits don't look as pretty. The vegetables don't look as pretty. They look like this carrot on this book cover. Uh, but um, the high fructose corn syrup is probably the number one takeaway I would have you avoid in terms of foods to avoid. Uh, corn syrup isn't much better. Uh, corn syrup is just pure glucose. And you know, by the way, table sugar is half fructose. It's, a, a, it's a, a, a two sugars combined. It's glucose plus fructose pasted together. So a teaspoon of table sugar is half fructose. And your body will convert excess sugar to fructose. And fructose you don't want. The omega-6s, which is any seed oil, uh, almost all oils that you can buy are already rancid by the time you pick them up when they sit out in the open with the fluorescent lights for a couple of months before someone comes along and buys them, they're half rancid uh, and deteriorated. And when you heat an oil about 400 degrees, it deteriorates into an oxidation bomb for your body. And how many times do you think when you buy french fries at eight o'clock at um, a fast food place, how many times do you think that oil has been heated throughout the day to make this the 40th batch of french fries? So you're getting an oxidation bomb when you do that. Um, and anything that um, promotes diabetes or glucose uh, is, a, is a real problem. I do wanna mention, I know we just have a couple of minutes left, but HNE, you're gonna hear a lot about HNE, and that stands for 4 hydroxy nonanol. It's something that's given off when you oxidize the omega-6 fats. The linoleic acid is the real bomb uh, in, in the omega-6 fats. And when it oxidizes, it turns to this HNE, and you're gonna read a lot about it because HNE makes you fat. It makes you fat even when you eat the same calories as your non-fat neighbor who's exactly like you. It makes you fat when you're eating normal calories. HNE comes from oxidizing of cheap seed oil. So you're gonna read a lot about that. We don't have time to go into it, but I'd encourage you to look that up. We're getting um, some questions coming in. Okay. 
And um, um, I did want to put in a plug for blueberries. I already plugged the avocados. Brain berries. Yeah, brain berries and um, macadamias. I've heard nutritionists with some knowledge say, if I had to go to a desert island, I only had one food, I would bring macadamias. One, one thing you can write this down, Joel Furman is a family doctor who does a lot of nutrition. He talks about G-bomb, that's his acronym, greens, berries, onions, mushrooms, beans, and seeds. G-bombs, really good for you. Yeah. Other questions? Well, and we didn't say yeah, fiber. But... One thing I do want to put in a plug for is water and fiber. Some people don't drink enough water, and you really need to drink water. If you eat salt and salty foods and don't drink water, you'll get fat. Salt will make you fat, unless you drink water. When you eat the pizza and you're drinking water all night, just keep drinking, because you need to neutralize. In, in, in nature, when you eat salt so much that it increases the salt in your blood, nature says you're starving, you need to eat more. That's the, and you will. So salt will make you fat. Unless you neutralize it with enough water, you need water. And you need fiber. Humans today have maybe 10 grams of fiber. Primitive humans, a million years ago, 70 grams of fiber. We need to get closer to that. Sugar, brown sugar, honey, maple syrup, and sugar substitutes, 30 I hope, seconds. <laughs> I, I helped my friend Joe Winter make maple syrup most years. And, it's a blast. You take 40 gallons of this, looks like water, turns into this little tiny bottle of maple syrup. But boy, does that taste good. I think a dab of that's okay. I think honey, especially if it's grown locally, there's good reasons why locally processing grown honey is good. It helps with allergies if you have hay fever and so forth, but not gobs of it. It's sugar. They're all sugar. And sugar, if it raises your blood sugar, is too much for you. And there's going to be a lot of people doing home glucose monitoring or continuous glucose monitoring who don't have diabetes because that's how important it is. Many people can eat sugar all day and it doesn't really impact their health that much, but it's too hard to know if you're one of those. So just assume you're not. Assume that when you eat sugar, it turns to fructose, which does all kinds of metabolic mayhem in your body that you want to avoid. And sugar substitutes? Yeah, anything that's sweet, you know, the artificial sweeteners are at least 100 times sweeter than sugar. And it's too easy to over-sweeten. And what I want people to do is to withdraw from liking sweetness. So you're addicted to the sweetness as much as to the molecule itself. And you can get away from that, but not with artificial sweeteners that are way too, sugar, too sweet. Uh, stevia, if someone tied you up and made you use one, just say, okay, I'll take stevia. Um, and I would use stevia, but um, even that is way sweeter. And I like to train people, you know, you can drink coffee without sugar. You just have to train yourself to do it. Uh, but the artificial sweeteners do really bad things. Saccharin turns to methyl alcohol when it's metabolized. Methyl alcohol, that's wood alcohol. That causes blindness. I mean, why would you take that? And you'll see all kinds of articles about each of the artificial sweeteners and the metabolic mayhem they cause. You're not doing yourself a favor. People who drink diet soda gain weight and get fat. It tricks your brain. There's a complicated trick that it makes you eat more. It stimulates your appetite. So you think you're losing weight with diet Coke? Think again. What over-the-counter vitamins uh, do you recommend for healthy uh, elderly people in good health? Are there risks of taking too many? And is Walgreens brand as good as organic? Uh -huh. So the question is about vitamins. Um, I, again, you can't really make blanket recommendations because each person needs evaluation. Just like I wouldn't just say, take this blood pressure pill for blood pressure, unless I knew more about you. So it needs to be individualized. But in general, it's very hard to imagine why uh, someone 65 and older should not take a vitamin B complex. Pick your brand. And I think Walgreens probably does a good enough job that their generic one is probably as good as anybody's because they're a really big outfit and they can afford to do quality control. When they say there's uh, five milligrams of melatonin, there's probably five milligrams of melatonin. Melatonin is an interesting supplement. People take it for sleep. Um, however, your brain makes less than one milligram of melatonin every night to put you to sleep like a baby. 
Children make gobs of melatonin. They don't need melatonin, but when we get older, we don't make it as much anymore. And when, you, when they analyzed all the bottles of melatonin, they were supposed to be five milligrams. They got anywhere from none to 100 milligrams. So when you buy it over the counter, that's what you get. You may get five, or you may get none, or you may get 100. So that's, did you say a brand name? I missed it. A brand name of? Of a vitamin that you prefer, or melatonin? No, no, I don't do brand names. <laughs> <laughs> no, ma'am. No, so um, a, a B complex is good, especially if you're uh, uh, above age 65. I think trying to get demedicated or de-prescribing, they call it, this is getting popular in the dementia literature. Uh, de-prescribing, getting people off the sentence if they really, really don't need it, getting them off the anti-acid drugs for the stomach if you really, really don't need it. And don't just cut it off cold, and for God's sakes, don't do it without advising, getting the advice of your medical professional. But we, we do a lot of de-prescribing, and I think that's as, probably as effective helping people as anything we do, de-prescribing. I think we should go visit the exhibitors. Is it time? It's time. OK, so please visit the exhibitors. Um, they're down the hall. Talk with them. Even if you yourself don't require their service, maybe somebody you know could benefit from it. So they help us put on this uh, uh, summit. And please visit them. And then uh, we'll return for our final session at 1145, if that's OK. Welcome back, everybody. Hope you learned some things from our exhibitors. All right. We've fielded a lot of questions about nutrition. Um, there's a lot of good resources on nutrition. I think Dr. Zook is going to talk to us about other risk factors in this last session. And then don't forget to hang around for lunch. And you can continue asking questions at the table, get resources from each other. And um, any other housekeeping things? We have a lot of questions here. We're probably not going to get to all of them. Thank you for the questions. And take it away. So I don't know if I have an hour and 15 minutes of talk left in me. I've never talked this much at one spot. But, um, it's worth every minute to get the feedback and the questions. It just means a lot to me that you're listening and that this seem, the message seems to be landing. So I really appreciate that. Um, and um, towards the end, we'll uh, ask for uh, lots more questions. So be sure you write them down, bring them forward, or just raise your hand, and someone will pick them up. We appreciate you folks online, and we want to honor your questions as well. So please send them forward, and we'll be sure to get some of those answered. And you know, if you submit questions with your name, uh, email, and a phone number, We'll try to answer them even after the fact when this conference is over. We did that uh, a year ago. We answered everyone that we could find. Uh, and so we're willing to do that. But you know, if you have a question, other times we'd be thrilled if you just called the Dementia Resource Center and what about this? I mean, you have a burning question, feel free to do that. Uh, I'm not there every moment, but uh, someone usually is. And if, the person answering the phone can't answer the question. They'll get in touch with somebody who can. So uh, just so you know that. So our last session is going to be talking about um, risk factors. So here we go. So uh, as I said, we like to go upstream to the cause of dementia. And if we do that, and we can effectively change something that had to do with causing your dementia symptoms. Uh, that's what we want to do. But you know, before Alzheimer's disease pops out and gives you symptoms, it's still Alzheimer's disease. But we just don't do brain biopsies to prove that in living people. So we don't know if for sure you have Alzheimer's disease 20 or 30 years before it actually pops out. And as I said, I don't think the medicines that we have for it are very effective. Even the new UMAB drugs, they all end in UMAB. Uh, and so let's work on what risk factors we can dig up. And the ones that are fixable, let's try to fix those. And that's kind of our strategy. And that's the strategy we think all dementia care 
should follow. We think when you do a drug study on 10,000 people, you need to get all the risk factors down to zero as low as possible before you give them the drug or the placebo. They don't do that. They might control for smoking if you're a man or a woman or your age, but they don't control for all these things. Well, I could stack the uh, placebo group with all the sleep apnea people, the smoke, and do, never exercise and make my data look pretty good with my experimental drug. So uh, whenever they do drug studies, did you control for all the known dementia risk factors should be the first question. And they should get everyone's dementia risk factors fully assessed and modified and six months down the road, then enter them in the study, but they don't do that. And I think that's part of the reason why the studies are not consistent. And it's hard to get consistency in dementia studies where it's multifactorial. When you wanna get a grant for a study, they only want you to study one thing. Well, dementia isn't that way. It's 20 things, you know, and that's not the way our system works currently. But if you look at all the list of risk factors, the most common ones, the ones that do lend themselves to fixing, I've listed them here. Hypertension has to be right at the top of the list, but why did you get hypertension at age 35 when you're a teacher and you have to work on the weekends to make ends meet and so forth, and you have to work two jobs all summer instead of taking the summer off? Well, let's look at that, and why did you get hypertension? Is your nitric oxide low? If it is, because you don't eat any green leafies, maybe that'll help. You know, this, um, the one doctor here, um, it's, uh, yeah, Richard Johnson, the one that wrote uh, Nature Wants Us to Be Fat. He did studies on teenagers who were obese and had high blood pressure. And they, were, they didn't have renal artery stenosis or any of the anatomical causes. They just had high blood pressure. They didn't exercise. They were sedentary by and large. They were obese and they had high blood pressure, brand new. And he said, let's measure their uric acid. And a lot of them had way elevated uric acid. They treated the uric acid with allopurinol and their blood pressure went away. I never heard that before, but that was a study he did in the last couple of years. Now, if you leave the blood pressure there until they're 20 or so, it doesn't work. But if you get it right away, when they first start showing hypertension, uh, you treat the uric acid. In other words, you're allowing more nitric oxide to come back and your blood pressure goes away. How you treat uric acid isn't so much with allopurinol, although that works, but it's to get rid of the sugar. If you can convince the child to not eat sugar and high fructose corn syrup, that's probably a good first step, but they don't do that. They give you a placebo or they give you the antihypertensive medication. So hypertension doesn't necessarily have to be hypertension. If you can go upstream and get to the cause, that's even more important. It makes a lot more sense. But hypertension is so prevalent in our society. And you know, it turns out that one of these doctors talks about history of medicine. In the 1900s, early 1900s, just after 1899, you had to scrounge around hundreds of people to find enough people with hypertension to have a study. You couldn't find enough people with hypertension in 1900 or 1905 or 1910. You couldn't find people who had um, high blood pressure. You couldn't find people with elevated uric acid. They didn't have elevated uric acid. It was three or 3.5. Since then, we've changed our nutritional status. Did you ever see, and I bring this story up, and forgive me those of you who have already heard it, I love those pictures of workers in the 1800s taking the railroad out west, where they're in Wyoming, and you know it's like 97 degrees, and they've got their vests and their suit coat, and they're grimy from head to toe, but they're sitting there grim with their pitchforks, and there's like, 30 or 40 of them, and there's not one that weighs more than 150 pounds, not one. They ate once a day with their grubby hands, and that's how they lived. Um, they, none of them probably had hypertension or high uric acid. Um, but it, fast forward to today, I love watching, I don't like to go to the state fair because there's no place to sit down. <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> But I love to watch the newsreel and say, oh, we had the state fair, we had 100,000 people, and they show gobs of people. 
And there's hardly any of them that are normal weight or less. Well, I guess you go there to eat to begin with, right? But how do you eat a turkey leg standing up? I don't know how they do that, but um, times are changing. And the people who make the standards for our diet are doing it for financial reasons. And I don't know how we got into that, but every VA hospital in the country has to serve food based on the standards that the USDA set. That's a lot of food. When I go to the nursing home and I see people eating, it's noodles, potatoes, mac and cheese, cookies, cookies, and did I mention cookies? You know, I'd love to do a study, and I'd love to get uh, a grant to do a study where we take average 100 people in a nursing home, and we get to say what they eat. And first of all, you have to find 100 people willing to do that, and it'd be complicated. But I'd like to see just how things change at the nursing home when we give them the ideal diet, even people in their 70s and 80s. I'd love to see the results of that. So if anybody wants to donate a couple million dollars for that study, let me know. <laughs> uh, but because it's not going to get a blockbuster, multi-billion dollar profit drug, that study won't happen in America, I guarantee you. So, um, and um, cardiovascular disease, coronary artery disease is an interesting disease. I've had uh, acquaintances who run marathons get a quadruple bypass. Why does someone who never smoked, runs gobs of miles, runs marathons, get, need a coronary artery bypass graft for coronary artery disease, that which gives you heart attacks? Why would that be? Well, it, partly genetics, but, um, and partly, and most of them have like way normal cholesterol. And by the way, did you know that the majority of people coming into the emergency room for the very first heart attack, the majority of them have normal cholesterol? And 15% of them have way normal cholesterol. Even the extreme that the specialists recommend, 15% of them. And there they are with their first heart attack. So cholesterol is not the only reason you get a heart attack. It's inflammation. The vessels are inflamed. What's bad for the ve blood vessels is bad for the brain. And there's a connection there. Vascular health depends on things like uric acid and nitric oxide that we talked about. And that's why I chose those, because they're all tied together and they're all part of the same syndrome, if you will. And we call it metabolic syndrome, but I mean, there's other names for it. But it involves blood sugar and, and so forth. But um, vascular turns out to be really important risk factor, because if you already have a vascular disease, even if you're a young person, um, that's um, a risk factor for dementia later on. Now, if you get it attended to, you get your blood pressure down and in the normal range, and you do all the other things. You can't just medicate your way out of health, into, into cardiovascular health. You also need to keep your weight down. You need to exercise. You need the stress relief. If you're stressed out of your guard all day, every day, and we see this with caregivers. We worry about caregiver stress, and that needs attention. And that's why we say we don't want to extract the patient as an individual case outside of their milieu. Their milieu is the whole family, especially the caregiver. Being a caregiver for more than a year for somebody that you love with dementia is a really high risk factor for dementia yourself. So caregivers of a loved one that they love dearly, and this is not commercial caregivers, for more than a year for dementia has way elevated risk for dementia themselves. That's how stressful it is. So, and we've seen people who've been caregivers for eight or 10 years. It's amazing. Um, and then atrial fibrillation. You know, I, I want to get my cardiology friends and colleagues on track with the importance of atrial fibrillation looking forward into risk for dementia. You know, the big thing about atrial fibrillation, it's an irregular heart where your heart beats the interval between each beat is different. So it's bup, 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 It's all irregular. And it's fairly common in people our age, 65 and above. But atrial fib allows your blood to sort of pool in the atria. And if your atria are big, uh, because you're a marathon runner, you're more likely to get clots in there if you go in and out of atrial fib. And so quite often, 
uh, they're treated with anticoagulants so you don't get stroke. But even so, when we see the scans of people who have this back history of atrial fib, they have this white matter vascular abnormality on their MRI scan, which is indicative of little tiny strokes going on. Now, if you have a big stroke and you're paralyzed and you're blind and you go to the emergency room, that's a big stroke. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about little tiny strokes in a shower of clots of maybe two or 300 red blood cells clots into your brain in multiple areas. You don't get paralysis, you don't get blindness, you don't get the typical stroke thing where your arm comes down. You just get cognitive dysfunction. And I think this is a big deal and I don't think it's solved yet, but I really worry about atrofib being attended to fully, completely, and as carefully as you can. And um, in the old days, we used an anticoagulant called Coumadin. And there are people with artificial valves who must take Coumadin because the new expensive anticoagulants aren't indicated. And when you take um, Coumadin for years and years, Coumadin works by binding your vitamin K. And vitamin K keeps calcium from forming in your arteries and heart valves. So when you take Coumadin for 30 years, your valves are calcified, your arteries are calcified, proving the necessity of vitamin K. But atrial fib, I really worry about it contributing to dementia if it's not fully taken care of. And when I see people are left in atrial fib, the left in atrial fib bothers me. If there's any way we can uh, change the electrical system, an ablation or some other thing, if it's feasible, um, I would think it's well worth the chance because atrial fib puts you at risk for little baby clots that go everywhere. And I don't, I don't know if we pay enough attention to that. Peripheral vascular disease, there are people, especially smokers, who the arteries in their legs and other places are constricted when they exercise and the muscles call for more oxygen, the vessels can't provide, they get pain in their leg when they walk, that's called claudication pain. That's a vascular disease and that too has a risk for dementia. What's bad for the blood vessels is bad for the brain. By the same token, what's good for the blood vessels is good for the brain. So the glass is half full or half empty, depending how you look at it. Um, <clears throat> and sleep apnea, you know, atrial fib and sleep apnea, I consider them cousins. If you have sleep apnea, you've got a 50% chance of having atrial fib somewhere along the line, if you're our age. If you have atrial fib, you've got at least a 50% chance of having sleep apnea. And as I said before, half the people with sleep apnea don't know they have it. And so if I was a doctor treating some brand new atrial fib patient, I'd recommend either a sleep study or a screening test for a sleep study because 50% chance my older adult patient has sleep apnea that's unattended, damaging their brain every night that that goes on. So I look the two as very important. If someone gets new atrial fib, they should get a test, at least a screening test. You can wear an oxygen measuring overnight, and if your oxygen stays 98, you're golden. If it goes down to 80, you better get a formal sleep study and get treated. Very important. It's a very remediable problem that contributes to a lot of dementia in this country. Other sleep disorders, REM sleep behavior disorder. How many of you have heard of that, REM sleep behavior disorder? It's a significant risk factor for dementia. And what it is, is when you sleep, when you're in your dream, your REM sleep, you're paralyzed. There's something that happens in your brain that paralyzes you. So even when you're punching the guy and kicking him, your arms don't move because you're paralyzed. Well, that doesn't work in some of us. And then you punch your spouse or whoever's in the bed with you, you kick and you thrash around and sometimes you fall out of bed. REM sleep behavior disorder. And there are treatments for it. And it's recommended that they be treated. And if it is suppressible with medication, there's a benzodiazepine. But before that, they try melatonin, but way higher doses of melatonin. They start with three, six, nine, they go up. Uh, much higher doses to treat REM sleep behavior disorder. And it's unclear to me if treating it lessens your risk for dementia, but it looks like it might. And since it's fairly harmless uh, reason to treat that. But REM sleep behavior disorder is also a marker for Parkinsonism and uh, a kind of dementia called Lewy body dementia. It doesn't mean you're doomed to get it, but you have to start watching for that. And there are many other sleep disorders that young 
30-year-olds, 40-year-olds get. And studies show that if those are unattended, unfixed, your risk for dementia goes up. So sleep disturbances, and we have sleep doctors, and I forget what the fancy name for sleep doctor is. There's a fancy name, so you have to have a name for everything that's difficult. But anyway, they will analyze your sleep and help you with strategies for sleep. They don't just do tests of the, for sleep happening. They do, they'll talk to you about good sleep hygiene and how you, you, know, you want to have your room totally dark and you want to have a, a, a nightlight that isn't blue color because blue color makes you wakeful. Uh, how if you have a nightlight, it should only come on when you move. It shouldn't be on. You want it dark. You want it cold. It should be 10 degrees colder than the rest of your house if you can. That's sleep hygiene. And there are specialists that can talk to you about that. But if you have a 30 or 40 year old child and their sleep is very disturbed, have them get it evaluated and get it taken care of because that contributes to brain malfunction later. So sleep apnea and sleep disorders. And then you get into the whole thing of diabetes. Now we have lots of words that sort of mean diabetes. Insulin resistance is the general chemistry where insulin doesn't work driving sugar into cells, basically, is what insulin resistance is. And insulin resistance in your brain is almost universal in every single Alzheimer's patient. Now, I'm saying Alzheimer's on purpose because there are other dementia. It's been shown more in Alzheimer's than the others, but probably to some degree has uh, an effect where the brain cells don't get to utilize fuel, which is glucose. And if the insulin isn't doing it, the insulin may be impaired. And generally in these people, their insulin level is very high because the insulin is being pumped out to try to do more and more. And how much insulin you have generally will do the job if you have enough of it. But at a point, it's diminishing returns and your blood sugar starts to go up and you have diabetes. I think 90% of type 2 diabetes, and most diabetes, 90% of it is type 2, and there are exceptions, but most of it, 90% is curable with behavioral management. If I, and I kid my colleagues about Dr. Zook's Desert Island, where I'd like to just take some people there and drop them in by helicopter, and um, they can only eat what I tell them. They have to exercise, and every night we sing Kumbaya and tell stories around the campfire, and, if we did that, we could get rid of 90% of type 2 diabetes. I'm convinced. Now, that implies a lot of things, that they are compliant, that they don't have other medical complications and so on. But they never taught us that in medical school. They just said, what drug are you going to use? What drug? Wait until the downstream problem occurs, and we can lower your blood sugar with very expensive drugs. But we didn't get to the cause of it. We send you to the island, and you get the island treatment. You don't need any pills 90% of the time. And wouldn't that be better? But diabetes is so much a part of dementia or pre-diabetes or almost diabetes. We have all these classifications. If you're fasting, sugar is much above 100. You're probably in that range. Some people think any fasting blood sugar above 90. It's all over the chart. But the higher your fasting sugar, the more likely is a problem. But what do doctors do to detect diabetes? They do a fasting sugar. Well, that's the last thing that goes haywire. You could have the pre-diabetes for several years. The first thing that happens is your insulin level changes. So your fasting insulin level is sky high long before your fasting blood sugar is abnormal, long before your A1C goes up. The A1C doesn't go up until your fasting sugar is high. Then the A1C goes up. So we've got it backwards. We always do either an A1C if we're really serious or we do a fasting sugar. But what really goes haywire first, the first warning sign of diabetes is an insulin, a fasting insulin that's elevated. Now we argue about what's normal. If you look on the normal for Centricare, it's way higher than I think it should be. And dementia circles, they argue about what's a normal fasting insulin. But anyway, if your blood test for diabetes is normal, that's great. But could you still have pre-diabetes? Absolutely. Look at the fasting insulin. And we recommend virtually every one of our recommendations, please do a fasting insulin. And only about half the time the doctors will do that. They've never done one. So they don't want to do it. Well, if I don't do it, it must not be important. But 
Fasting insulin is the first marker that something. And we Americans, we want a, a for sure biomarker that tells us we have it. We don't want just doctors to accuse us of eating bad. You know, that's like subjective. We want a biomarker that proves we're eating bad. And so a fasting insulin would give you that. So we got through that. And then COVID-19. I really worry about the endothelial damage of COVID-19. Even a casual, I was sick for a little cough and I took Paxlovid, I worry about that. I worry that in the next 10 years, we're gonna see a lot of dementia. And I worry about the endothelial damage because what's bad for the blood vessels is bad for the brain. And I worry about that. And um, COVID is still out there. And then what about the next virus that comes along? What about the next mutation of COVID-19? I worry that we're gonna see a lot of problems and people have said you don't need to wear masks and all that. I think anything you could do to avoid getting COVID you should do. And uh, I think that's gonna have a dramatic impact on the incidence, the prevalence of dementia in our community. So the endothelium is the lining of your blood vessels, the inside lining. The muscle part is on the outside, but the endothelium is critical. It's a it's almost like an organ system all on its own. It, it, it does things that open the artery when it needs to, to let in more blood, like when you exercise or run up the stairs, or to constrict when your arm gets too cold in the ice water, when you're trying to fish minnows out of the bucket and, it's, and you're ice fishing, <laughs> and it's supposed to contract. But when you don't have enough nitric oxide, it just sits there like porcelain. It doesn't dilate, it doesn't contract, it just sits there like porcelain. And it's hard to think about that when you're looking at that jelly donut at the coffee shop thinking, hey, do I really need that, you know? But um, eating low sugar, low carb, I think when you hit age 50, it's great if you do that from then on, but I see kids eating way too much sugar. My grandkids eat way, they take syrup and put it on the plate and they get one of these, they call them waffles, they're like round things you put in a toaster and then it's, smear all the, and then the right on a while it says high fructose corn syrup. Well, now they're bragging in the syrup. If you looked on the syrup pile, the maple syrup, now it's not Joe Winter maple syrup, it's brown stuff that tastes like maple. Uh, they brag no fructose, no high fructose corn syrup. They brag about it. And then they put some other awful stuff in there. And so they put corn syrup, which is pure glucose. But, um, but uh, Diabetes and sugar and endovascular, the, the endothelial injury and damage, that's where it's at. And that's the basis of virtually all our chronic major diseases, blood vessel health or not. Blood vessel health or not determines how your brain survives and how you get dementia or you don't get dementia. Or if you get dementia, it's when you're 89 instead of 69. What, what's wrong with that? You know, when you, and my friends will say, you can't prevent dementia because when they talk about the brain, they think in the absolute terms. Prevent means you never get it 100%. Well, we don't say that about coronary artery disease. We say prevention, meaning maybe we delay it. I don't know why it got so that when we're talking about, you know, dementia, it has to be absolute. Well, I call it prevention if I delay the onset by 10 years. I'm calling that prevention. If I delay it by two years, I'm calling that prevention. So um, that's why you know, a lot of people still say you shouldn't use the word prevention and dementia in the same sentence. We never did when I was in medical school because it was, well, we didn't talk about dementia. So sugar, do I need to say it, is really important. <laughs> We've hammered that beyond recognition. Um, and then in our interviews, we've discovered some really traumatic stories. Not everyone. You know, I mean, there are many people like me grew up in a loving family where everyone loves you. And, you know, we didn't have everything, but we were happy. And, and not everyone has that. And what hurts you as a child, the event ends, but the trauma lives on. And the trauma can live forever. Better that there would have been an intervention, even a medication intervention, right after the trauma, like they do for PTSD and soldiers. We didn't do that 30 years ago. We didn't do that 20 years ago. We didn't do that 10 years ago. 
And if it's way ago than that, well, you certainly didn't do it. And we see a lot of kids that grew up in uh, isolated farmhouse and bad things were happening. And as soon as they were 18, the boys went in the service and left. The girls got married and left the farm and tried to get out of the abusive situation. The events ended, but the trauma lives on, especially if it's not attended to. And that really, I'm convinced, really hurts the brain. It really hurts the brain. ACE, Adverse Childhood Experiences, that's what the ACE stands for. You can't go back and change history. Um, and maybe sometimes counseling stirs up a rat's nest of bad feelings. And, you know, a good counselor could help you through that. But, and a lot of people don't want to admit that they need to see a counselor. It's sort of a pejorative connotation, sort of like being lonely. You don't want to admit to it and they're ashamed. And it's terrible how people who are abused feel ashamed and embarrassed and it shouldn't be so. They should feel entitled to go see the counseling that they need. And would it be nice if counseling was actually paid for like it should be? It's not. And if it takes five months to see a counselor for a crisis, what kind of crisis care is that? Well, you can go to the emergency room, you know, with all the flashing lights and but we need to do better on mental health. And mental health, if we don't take care of it, it's gonna worsen and snowball in future generations. They're even talking in Paul Conti's book on trauma, uh, how the trauma goes down generations. The grandchild evidences the behavior reflecting the grandparents' trauma. Who would have thought? How, you know, and, there are many people who break the cycle, who have to their credit, they were abused by their parents, but they don't abuse anybody. And that takes a lot of energy. And, but if then your child suffers the effect of your parents' trauma, that just doesn't seem fair. But anyway, they're writing about that. Why it's so important that we have a good counseling and mental health and behavioral health system that gets paid for. And you don't have to beg and plead and fill out insurance papers and get prior authorization and all the other rigmarole just so they don't have to pay for it. We're going to pay dearly for not paying for mental health. And I think we might pay dearly if we don't figure out a way to fund dementia care. Infections. Um, who would have thought that cold sores could lead to more risk for dementia? It's associated. We all get, well, not all of us, but a lot of us get sores in our mouth. And that's from the cold sore herpes. And that is found in the brains of many people who die with dementia. No, association doesn't mean causation, but they're there. And the same with the shingles virus. The shingles virus is found in the brains of many people who get an autopsy of the brain who die with dementia. So you can get pills for cold sores. You can get the cream. The cream doesn't get in your brain. The pills do. And when you get shingles, uh, they can give you pills or not, depending on the doctor's preference. I'd say, please, doctor, give me the pills, because I got a big patch of shingles. It's, it's hurting me. And it's not so much to get rid of the shingles, although it may help with that, but it's to, there's an association of that virus in the brains of people who die with dementia. Now remember, because it's there doesn't mean it caused it, but it's really suspicious. But what the chronic inflammation of a virus that hangs out in your brain, that inflammation does hurt your brain. Not so much in the infection model, like the pneumonia germ gives you pneumonia and you die, but just because it creates a chronic inflammation. In gum disease, uh, a recent lecture that I heard said that about half of us over 65 have inflammatory gum disease. And when you have an implant, the base of the implant's infected, about 20% of us. That's even worse because the nerve has been killed by the procedure, and you don't feel pain when there's an infection in there. So when my wife lost a tooth, it was in a place that didn't really matter so much uh, as far as chewing. The dentist referred us to uh, someone who does endodontics and so forth. I said, well, what's the harm if we leave it alone? He said, well, it shouldn't be any harm. But what kind do you want? I said, well, we don't want any. So we left a gap there. Because those implants do get inflamed. Not a lot, but 20%. I guess I'd, if I can live without the tooth, I'd live without the tooth. Now, if it's right in the front, okay, maybe you have to 
fill it in. But those do get inflamed. And even without all that, 50% of us have inflammatory gum disease. There's a germ in your mouth that most of us have called Porphyromonas gingivalis. And it's present in the brains of many of the people who get an autopsy who died from dementia. Porphyromonas gingivalis, they're even using it to, uh, in archaeology, there's not that germ, but other germs like it to follow when the first Americans came down the Bering Strait into, they're, they're following germs. It's, they actually use the H. pylori stomach germ. But uh, P. gingivalis is going to be a, a major thing. And when you use the mouthwash uh, to kill it, you, you're killing the good germs as well. But Porphyromonas gingivalis makes a substance called gingipanes. And the gingipanes goes right up the cranial nerves into your brain. And gingipanes stops you from eliminating the beta amyloid. And beta amyloid is what all these expensive drugs do to bind and get rid of. Well, gingipanes stops your ability to clear out your own beta amyloid. And they're trying to figure out gums and other things that gets rid of the ginger pains produced by Porphyromonas gingivalis. Who would have thought a germ in our mouth could give us dementia? But P. gingivalis is there, and I think you're going to read about that because there's going to be gums and other products come out to try to get rid of it. But it's present in almost all of us. But there's good germs and there's bad germs in your mouth, and it's a detente that goes on all the time. The microbiome of your mouth. It's a little different than the microbiome of your stomach where there's good germs and bad germs. You want to favor the good germs by giving them lots of fiber. That's a prebiotic. That means food that the good germs like. You give them lots of fiber, fiber, and fiber. They like garlic. They like onions. And the right foods makes the good germs in your intestine happy. And I'm not sure how you get rid of P. gingivalis, but I suspect they'll find out that P. gingivalis does some good things in your mouth. It's just keeping it under control so it's not out of whack. But infections, um, and you can argue about tick-borne diseases till the cows come home. I mean, they have two-week seminars on tick-borne diseases, Lyme disease you're familiar with. Uh, Minnesota was a hotbed for years. Now we realize that most states have tick-borne diseases. But they're sneaky. You know, they're, they're different kind of germs. They're not like regular bacteria. And they can set up an inflammatory process in your brain that goes on and on and on, even when all the germs have been killed. So getting uh, uh, repelling ticks and not getting bit by ticks makes a lot of sense. And when you do and you got the bullseye patch, go get treated. And then do follow-ups to make sure you got completely treated. So germs, where else would germs be? Well, germs would be um, in any cut or infection, but sneaky things. Um, some people with colitis have germs involved in that. There's, there's other places, but um, any, any infection, and we're talking probably for most of us, oral infections need to be treated. We see a lot of people with several teeth missing, and the ones that are there aren't looking too good, and they're probably inflamed. Uh, and I'm not sure every dentist is dementia informed, but how you deal with that could make a big difference. Do you know that Porphyromonas gingivalis is found in the coronary artery biopsies when people die of a heart attack? They find P. gingivalis in the artery wall. And this is something we've known for years. And other bacteria in the mouth are found in the walls of the little tiny arteries that keep our heart muscle alive. So it's, if you got an infection, you want to get it cleared up. Toxic exposures. I could talk about Roundup. I've heard all day seminars on Roundup, which is glyphosate. And Roundup, when you spray it on your wheat product, just at the harvest, it makes the wheat mill a beautiful white flower that looks just really good. And then the chemists will say, oh, but the glyphosate, it's gone in 24 hours. No, it's not. Dr. Bredesen in California, who we try to emulate in our, he, he's done blood tests on people. And virtually every one of his people had a measurable glyphosate level. And the people that were the worst tended to have the highest level, and so on. So just a word to the wise. You know, I go to my dear hardware store, and they've got stacks of Roundup in a pyramid, you know. When you spray that stuff, it gets absorbed through your skin. It hurts your brain. It's not good for your brain. Occupational exposure. People work in battery plants where they recycle batteries. 
There's a lot of bad things that happen there, lead, cadmium. Uh, people who smoke have a lot of cadmium in their blood and cadmium levels uh, can also lead to dementia. Mercury, uh, people who like raw fish and sushi. You know, my daughter and her husband love sushi and they want a special treat. They go to a sushi bar and they bring it home and I say, you know, this stuff wouldn't be bad if you just cook it, you know. 400 degrees for about an hour and it'd be just about right, you know, for me. But, but the bigger the fish, the more mercury they have. So a big tuna, big tunas are really big and they have a ton. It's a food chain thing. The big fish eat the little fish and then the bigger fish eat those fish. And, and by the time you're a thousand pound tuna, you've got a ton of mercury. And so I love tuna fish, but I don't want mercury. So toxic exposure. Service related, you've seen the burn pits that the service people, when they leave Afghanistan, they throw everything in a big pit and burn it and gives off these toxic fumes and God knows what's in there, but probably plastics and things like that where, and that's really bad for you. And we're gonna learn to shield our soldiers from that, but um, I worry about those kind of toxicity. Um, and then poor diet, well, we talked a lot about high fructose corn syrup, that's what HFCS is but sugar and sugar and sugar, and it's everywhere. Um, processed food you're gonna read a lot about. Processed food is anything that's not a whole food that didn't get plucked out of your garden. Uh, processed food is everywhere. In most of the food in the grocery store, the majority is processed. And I used to love to go to the deli and get that tavern ham slices, but boy, that's not good for you. And that's highly processed. And, you know, if you get a package of food and it says outdates in the year 2052, <laughs> what's that all about? You know, that's process, you know. So processed food you're gonna read a lot about and um, I think uh, you wanna avoid the processed food. And I think it says dehydration. Yeah, yeah. and then what's after dehydration? Oh, vitamin deficiencies. We talked a little bit about vitamin deficiencies. Um, but you can get um, vitamin deficiencies for a number of reasons, mostly if you remove the acid in your stomach. But you know, if you watch um, older people eat, they eat what's convenient, especially if they're one of the people living alone. What's convenient? Well, I can make mac and cheese. You know, mac and cheese, that mysterious orange stuff that coats the macaroni, I call it cheese-like substance. I'm not sure what's in there. Uh, and they eat that a lot because it's easy and toast and donuts. And some of them drink milk, but they have to go to the store to get milk. So they have fruit juice and, and it's a lot of carbs. And um, like I said, if I could get a research project and take people in the nursing home, give them the right foods that I would like them to eat, I'd be very interested to see what results they got. Uh, dehydration we did mention before, but if you eat a lot of salt, make sure you drink a lot of water. Because if you, people who have, live on a high salt diet often are overweight or fat. When you eat too much salt and you don't have enough water, you will be fat. And carbs, starches, you know, we didn't really get into that, but anything made from wheat or something like wheat, so that's bread and rolls. And you know, most of our sodium comes from bread and rolls. Only 11% of your sodium is dietary that you put the salt shaker on. The rest comes from our food and bread and rolls has a ton of salt. Who would have thought? And sedentary lifestyle. Boy, you know, I, I see my, uh, my daughter's uh, girls are both very active and their other children are very active. But a lot of kids sit around on their iPads and they're so entertaining. I mean, when we were kids, the shows were really dumb, like the so-and-so political party convention. Who wants to watch that? Or some guy talking about the news, whatever that was. And it was so bad, we just went outside and played baseball all day and ran and played. And our mother would drag us in for supper, wash our hands, and then we'd go out. But we couldn't go out until after seven o'clock. But as soon as it got dark, she would yell and we'd drag us back in again. But kids nowadays, they stay on their iPads and it's way entertaining. Or they're being bullied on social media and they have to defend themselves. And uh, it, there's too many reasons. These are eight, 10, 12, 13 year old. I worry about them 
are they, when they finish college or they're started on their job of their life, are they going to make their health better or is it going to be worse? And I worry about that. But the sedentary lifestyle is, is there. Frailty is when people become frail, and this is people usually in later stages of dementia, but you don't have to have dementia. Maybe you have some other medical condition, a neurologic condition, you know, your, your joints hurt or whatever. But where you start to get the muscles actually shrinking, the muscle, it's called sarcopenia, the muscles shrink and become smaller, physically smaller. And we've had men in our practice who start off at 220, and we're seeing them at age 78, and they're 150 pounds, ringing well. And they're on a high-dose statin, and their bad cholesterol is like 45. And they're on a high-dose 80 milligrams of simvastatin. And uh, simvastatin causes muscle pain. And if you take away the muscle pain, you can exercise. When you can exercise, you can sleep better. When you sleep better, your muscles come back. And you need those muscles, because when you fall, you need to grab something to save yourself from hitting your head. And we've seen people fall, they don't even put their arms out. They just fall forward and flat on their face. And if your muscles are too weak to defend yourself in a fall, you're in trouble, because most of us are going to have a fall or two in our lives. But, um, this frailty is a risk factor. And once you get into the frailty, it's hard to break that cycle. But it's good if we could get an exercise physiologist to come to your door every day with a whistle and a clipboard and Bermuda shorts and make you exercise. But it's, it's hard to do you know, when you're, you're in a routine. And a lot of times when you're the caregiver, it's so easy if they're just they're not fussing about something. Everything's quiet, or they're taking a nap. And, it's easy to just ride on that. But the problem is their muscles aren't being built up if you don't have some exercise time during the day. So frailty is a big one. And stress, you know, you, we should talk in primary care. We were stressed out of our gorge. I was for 40 years, but I never felt stressed. I was, I mean, towards the end, I didn't feel stressed. When I was doing deliveries for 14 years, I felt stressed. Every time they called me in the middle of the night for a delivery, I felt stressed. But we just took it on the chops because that was part of the deal. But people live that way all the time, not just doctors. They have kids. Kids are all in three or four activities. You know, they're president of this and leader of that and doing all kinds of stuff. And when your adrenal gland is pumping out adrenaline and all the stress hormones all day long, those hormones overdo and hurt your brain, hurt your brain function. You can get the same effect by giving someone steroids all the time, and there are medical conditions for which steroids are indicated. It will hurt your brain. But if you make your own steroids by being stressed out of your gourd, you need to figure something out so that you're not so stressed. Hard to do. Um, health habits in general. Smoking, it's interesting. We don't see many people smoking when they come to us. Almost all of them have quit smoking by the time they come to us. At least that's one thing we recognize as a bad actor, universally. High fructose corn syrup will get up there someday, but it's nowhere near the top. Right now, we know smoking is pretty unusual. And people worry about, um, uh, well, the head injury. Uh, we do see a fair number of people have had traumatic brain injuries. And they fell out of a pickup truck, or they got hit with a baseball bat. In, in the old days, we didn't do anything. We'd go sit on the couch for a few hours, and mom would come in and say, do you have a headache? No. OK, you can go out and play. You know, I mean, uh, that was it. But we now know that all those head traumas, and most kids have several of them by the time they leave home, um, it's hard to say. And head trauma is interesting when it does damage. You can't tell by looking if it was damaging. We don't get the vote on whether it was damaging or not. Your brain decides if it was damaging. And if it was, it was. It doesn't matter what it looked like. And the simplest thing, like a, a ball bouncing, a soccer ball bouncing off a goalie's head, looks at easy, but it may cause some brain injury. And that's pretty important. So we're getting better about that in organized sports, particularly in schools. We're getting way better at the college level, the pro level. But if you look at the pro uh, football players, how many of them who play 10 years or more have uh, traumatic 
encephalopathy, it's alarming. It's very, very high. And those of us who were never privileged, privileged to play or those of us whose coaches never let them play um, um, probably are better off in terms of their brain injury, brain um, dementia risk. So we have on our website, um, this is uh, something that Sarah Baker, our marketing person created for us. And there's 47 questions in there. You can just go on our website and take the test. If your score is above 10, that'd be of concern. However, we need to redo this because since we published this, there's been about a handful, maybe 10 more risk factors that we're putting in. There's 47 questions, but it really asks about 100 risk factors because if someone had to answer 100 questions, they would never do the test. So we snuck those in there. But um, there's a QR code that you could scan, and I think we have that on some of our materials there. But just go to our website, it's on there. Um, but we use that, and we think that anyone doing dementia care should do a dementia risk assessment. Any drug study where we're studying the effectiveness of a drug for dementia needs to clear the deck first, get everyone's risk factors down to as low as possible, and then do the study. Uh, but this risk uh, assessment it should be become a routine for all dementia care. Um, I don't see that even in our biggest, our two biggest medical centers in the state do not do that, that I could tell. So um, thanks for attending and we appreciate your attention today. We'll have some more questions uh, that we'll take uh, here currently. Um, Hopefully, uh, we as a community will rise above uh, this issue by collaborating and helping. If you, uh, you don't need to be a dementia expert to help, we have opportunities for volunteering. Um, um, so as I said, we as a community need to deal with this. We need all the help we can get. We appreciate donations. We're going to ramp up. We're going to scale up and get bigger with the federal grant. And hopefully the federal grant will be able to enable us to hire uh, clinicians to do the work that we have volunteers doing now. And uh, I think the future looks good if we can get that done. We're miles ahead of where we were uh, in 2015 when we started this, uh, but it does take a community. And talk things up, talk dementia prevention up amongst your colleagues and friends. It should be common parlance that we talk about that. like. We talk about smoking and how bad it is. Uh, but you know all these other dementia factors, they're kind of curious and interesting to talk about, but strike up a conversation, get that going. Uh, please fill out the surveys. We count on feedback, and when we write for grants, we reflect the findings in the surveys, and they want to know what do the people want. And we need your comments and surveys. Certificates of attendance are available for those professionals that would like them. This event was certified for three hours of uh, continuing medical education for physicians, and many other professional groups will accept that certification as adequate. Um, this is a picture of us at the office uh, with our mission sign and some board members on the wall. And these are our contact numbers, and I think these exist also in some of your packet. But I want you to consider our caregiver conference October 26th. It's going to be at River's Edge Convention Center. And that center is mostly on caregivers, caregiver health, and caregiving behaviors, all that sort of thing. And that'll be October 26th. These were the books we gave away. And please follow us on Facebook and LinkedIn. Feel free to make a donation anytime you want. You can do it by scanning the QR code or just going to our website. These are people who have given us donations or um, helped us with large grants from Minnesota Board on Aging in particular and United Way. MedCycle Solutions was a sponsor today and Thrivent helped us with costs. Uh, Central Minnesota Council on Aging has sort of, I don't know, they're sort of like our um, big sister who got us going and helped us on our way and continued to give us advice, and we're thankful. 
Minnesota Medical Association has helped us. We did get a grant for doing Zoom uh, from them and so forth. And then these are people who helped with the summit, the exhibitors, the planning committee, and the event support. We appreciate St. Paul Neighborhood Network for um, getting all our technology going. Uh, Jules Bistro provided the lunches. We paid for those. <laughs> St. Mary's Cathedral, we gave them a small amount of money so that we could all park there for free. And we're thankful to St. Mary's for doing that. And that's it. I'll leave this up. And thank you, Dr. Zook, for talking for three hours today. Yeah. <laughs> Get a little bit.